Golden Age Radio is starting now. Subscribe to get future updates. Get ready for some spy thrillers and noir detective mysteries with The Man Called X, Secret Agent K7, Dangerous Assignments, Richard Diamond, Dick Tracy, The Avengers, Whistler, Shadow, Falcon, and Top Secret. Twice a day, see your dentist twice a year. Pepsodent presents The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. With the music of Felix Mills. Produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. There's a new Pepsodent toothpaste now. Yes, a new improved Pepsodent with a cleaner, brighter taste that means cleaner, brighter teeth. Try it. Taste it. Compare it. No matter how many brands you've tried or how faithfully you've brushed, see if your teeth aren't noticeably brighter in just one week after you change to new, improved Pepsodent toothpaste. You see, new Pepsodent toothpaste contains twice as much irium, the exclusive cleansing ingredient. New Pepsodent toothpaste with twice as much irium removes the film that makes your teeth look dull, uncovers the natural brilliance of your smile. Try it. Taste it. Compare it. And our Pepsodent presents Herbert Marshall as the man called X, international troubleshooter who flies the ocean at the drop of a hat, who charms the ladies, but is death on crooks. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Well, all the reviews were good. I know that every single paper. Oh, no. Mr. Thurston, did you notice that girl in the chorus? I noticed a lot of them, Pago. Anyone specific in mind? Well, personally, I prefer that brunette in the first row, you know, second from the left. Don't you mean the one second from the right? Uh, left? R right? Now, now you've mixed me all up. Uh oh, th there's the buzzer. Yes, let's go back in. Maybe the second act will clear up your problem. Now let's see, left, right. Darling, darling. I beg your... Oh, darling. Yes. Oh. Well, this is very pleasant. Oh, darling. It's been so long. Yeah, it certainly has. I, I simply can't believe it's you. I'm not so sure about it myself. Darling, you'll never know how wonderful it is seeing you. May I kiss you again? By all means. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. But now, lovely one, perhaps... Thank you. It... Take your filthy hands off her. I beg your pardon. You heard me. For two cents, I'd poke you in the nose. I'll gladly do it for nothing. Oh! Right on a button, Mr. Thurston. Who is he? I haven't the slightest idea. Huh? Well, m maybe the lady knows. Hey, she's gone. Well, easy come, easy go. You never told me about her, Mr. Thurston. Who is she? I never saw her before in my life. <laughs> now, let's see. I take a couple of extra shirts... Why are you being so mysterious, Mr. X? Why, why don't you tell us where we're going? We're going. Well, I mean, you and me. Well, I guess that's all I'll need. Pago, my friend, take care of yourself. Try to keep out of mischief, will you? Wait a minute, Mr. Thurston. What's the answer? Goodbye, Pago. But, but you know you always take me with you. In fact, they usually get there first. So long, and when you leave, don't forget to lock the door after you. Mr. Thurston, you can't do this to me. Mr. Thurston! Flight number 26 now arriving at ramp 2. Flight number 14 now leaving for Paris from ramp 6. Flight 14 leaving for Paris from ramp 6. Attention, please. Will Mr. Pagan Zellschmidt please Oh, no, not Pagan. Not all the way to Paris. Pagan, it's sometimes embarrassing, but I must admit I admire your ingenuity. 
In that case, Mr. Thurston, you'll be only too glad to reimburse me for the extra $10 I had to slip to the passage agent. Well, I suppose I may as well pay up now. Otherwise, our conversation on the way to Paris will be pretty monotonous. I know what we can talk about. Yes? Look, Mr. Thurston, you're not taking a holiday? No. Yes. Well? Pagan, did you happen to notice the Lavalier she was wearing? Aha, uh -huh. a clue. Who's Lavalier? A girl doesn't usually wear such a magnificent piece of jewelry like that. Unless she... Uh, wait a minute. Now, let me guess. I... I have it. The lady who kissed you right in the lobby. Then you did notice the La Lavalier. She was so ravishing, I didn't see anything but her. Too bad. Why? I'd like to get a better look at that Lavalier. Well, I, I don't blame you, but, but you said you didn't know her. How are you going to find her? By simply not letting her out of my sight. Hmm? Pagan, why do you think I took this particular play? Mr. Thurston, we've been walking around in circles so long, my feet are dizzy. So you're not enjoying yourself, Pagan? Parks, museums, Napoleon's bed. Who cares about Louis the Sixteenth snuff box anyway? Louis the Sixteenth. But he's dead, isn't he? What would you suggest we do, Pagan? I'll come down to brass tacks, Mr. Thurston. How you can spend a week in Paris and not even approach that beautiful woman is more than I can bear. It has taken a certain amount of restraint. You know where she lives. You know where she eats. You know where she shops. What's stopping you? I don't imagine the lady would be too pleased if she knew I'd followed her here. But she wouldn't recognize you, Mr. X. That is, unless you kissed her. Hmm, maybe you've got something there. Yes, let's see what happens. And now, mademoiselle, may I show you the latest thing in bus blouses? Merci, no. Uh, perhaps a culotte that is so chic for bicycling this summer. Merci, monsieur, but that will be all. Certainement, such a pleasure to serve you, mademoiselle. Bonjour. Darling. I beg your pardon. Oh, darling, it's so wonderful seeing you again. But I don't understand. I didn't either. Oh, it's you. Yes, the man in the lobby. But how do you happen to be in Paris? The funny thing, that's just what I was going to ask you. Then this really is a coincidence. I couldn't think of a happier one. Well, monsieur, I am happy. This gives me a chance to explain. Why explain? But really, monsieur. Uh, monsieur... Ken Thurston's my name. I am Lina Baril. Monsieur Thurston... I really don't go around kissing strangers in theater lobbies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm awfully glad it happened once, though. Thank you. You see, monsieur, I was a little desperate. I needed a friend, but I was a stranger there. I knew no one. You made a friend. I was very aggressive, I'm afraid. Yes. <laughs> it was a gamble. I had no way of knowing how you could respond. Mademoiselle, you underestimate yourself. I... Uh... I still have not explained, Monsieur Thurston. That man you knocked down, I had to get away from him. Someone you knew well? No, someone I detested. I was very unhappy when he turned up in New York. That night in the theater, he became abusive. You were very kind to play out my little drama with me. Well, perhaps we could rehearse another scene. At dinner tonight. That's nice of you. And I would be ungrateful if I did not accept. But, Monsieur... It would be impossible tonight. Tomorrow? Perhaps the day after tomorrow. Good. May I call you? It would be simpler for me to get in touch with you, monsieur. That will be simple, because I promise you I won't leave the Hotel Grand Palace until you do. And then what did she say, Mr. Thurston? Oh, she explained that it wasn't habitual, Pagan. Then what did you say, Mr. Thurston? I told her I understood. Then what did she say? Tell you later, Pagan. Yes? Ready on your call to New York, Mr. Thurston. Thank you. Go ahead, New York. Uh, hello. Hi, Chief. Ken Thurston, what the devil are you doing in Paris? Sorry I didn't check with you, Chief, but it was sort of personal. You see, a lady kissed me. Uh, who did what? She was very beautiful, and I didn't know her. That makes sense. Go on. So I thought I ought to know her better. Oh, that's great, Ken. I hope you're having a wonderful time. Not 
bad so far. Nice of you to call and let me know. Listen, Chief. If a ring shows up at the Bureau, a ring in the shape of a fleur-de-lis, set with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, will you let me know? Uh, it's a long chance. Hold on, Jack, hold on. Are you psychic? You couldn't know that. Oh, then it has turned up. Day before yet? How did you know? Part of the missing Rotterdam collection, isn't it? Yeah, sure. That's what I thought. Chief, do me a favor. Send that ring over on the first plane. But, Ken... Thanks. Tell you all about it later. Hey, now, wait a minute. Huh? Ken, what in the name of common sense are you doing? Why, Chief, don't you think one kiss deserves another? Bye. Mr. Thurston, I am beginning to smell a rat. Already? So you did get a closer look at that lavalier. Sure. And it was a fleur-de-lis set with emeralds, rubies, and diamonds? Uh-huh. You know, Mr. X, this is getting very interesting. You were beginning to worry me, Pagan. But now that you have that old familiar gleam in your eye, I'm reassured. Thank you. But what's this got to do with Rotterdam? Pagan, in 1940, when Rotterdam was leveled by Nazi bombs, one of the largest jewelry collections in Europe vanished. Uh-huh. For six years, nobody saw a trace of it. But recently, one at a time, these jewels have been turning up in various parts of the world, especially in America. Why didn't somebody tell me this before? I'm going back to America right away. Too late, Pagan. I have a notion most of those gems are where you can't get at them. In the Bureau. Why, I don't think I wasn't thinking of myself, Mr. Thurston. Who else? Oh. Well, goodbye. Just a minute. Did you say something, Mr. Thurston? Pagan, the last guy who tried to get that lavalier got a punch in the nose. Remember? You know, Monsieur Thurston, it's little accidents like this that make life so interesting. Accidents? I see a strange man in New York. Two weeks later, he's sitting with me in a cafe in Paris. That's because you kissed him. <laughs> Monsieur, please. You won't take that kiss too seriously. Would you be here now if I had? It must be what you call instinct or intuition. I must have known at once that I could trust you. You put me at a great disadvantage, Leonore. How do you mean, Ken? Now that you trust me, my hands are sort of tied. <laughs> you know, you're not a stranger. Not anymore. And yet for some reason... I don't know what to talk about. Well, there's music, paintings, books. But let's start with you. Me? I have a confession to make, Leonore. Oh? I came over on the same plane with you. You did? Said why didn't you... I had a strange idea that perhaps you'd think I was following you. Why should I think that? You're forgetting again. You kissed me. Oh. And you're not going to let me forget that. I can't. I guess we'd better find something else to talk about. We could talk about another favorite subject of mine. Jewelry. Your collector? Mm, an admirer. That uh, lavalier you're wearing is beautiful. <laughs> you like Very it? Very much. I'm glad it was a gift. Such a magnificent gift. My fiancé. Oh. Ken, do you mind? I told him you and I would be here for dinner. Why should I mind? I'd hoped you'd understand. He was very anxious to thank you for what you did for me. <laughs> That's nice. It's <laughs> very nice. Am I so amusing? No, no, Leonore. You're not amusing. Oh, no, you're wonderful. Oh, I see. You're very kind. You invite me to dinner. So I reward you with what you call it, my boyfriend. That's the general idea. I'm sorry, Kate. Why be sorry? I'm anxious to meet him. I'd like to congratulate him on his... Girlfriend. We should be here soon. In the meantime, shall we dance? Love. Dancing solves a great many problems, Ken. Yes, it brings people together. And you don't have to think about what to say next. You just follow the leader. I put it another way, Leonore. When anyone follows as gracefully as you do... That's something to talk about. Thank you. Oh, there's Etienne. Come, Ken. Bonsoir, Lena. Etienne, I want you to meet Monsieur Thurston. Etienne Sapierre. C'est un plaisir, Monsieur. Hello. Um, sit down, do. Merci. 
Monsieur Thurston, it is extremely fortunate that you are in Paris so that I might express my gratitude. Oh? Leonor has told me about how gallant you were to her in New York. Oh, not at all. Matter of fact, it was Leonor's own quick thinking. Leonor? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, she uh, she appealed to you for help, didn't it's she? Here. I, I was going to oh, tell you... You would have been very proud of her. She handled the situation perfectly. So? See, this fellow made a nuisance of himself, so we got rid of him. Very expertly, I understand. Have a drink, Mr. Saffier? Uh, merci, monsieur, but I did not mean to interfere with your evening. I merely wish to pay my respects. Perhaps I may return the courtesy someday, Monsieur Thurston. I wouldn't worry about that. It has been a pleasure. Au revoir, monsieur. Adieu, Leonor. It's very considerate of your fiancé to let us have this evening together. Ken, I did not tell him everything. Oh? I did not tell it yet that I kissed you. Well, perhaps it's just as well. You think so, Ken? Yes, you know, we can keep that little scandal to ourselves. Yes? Oh, it's you, Etienne. Did you expect someone else, Leonor? Of course not, darling. You enjoyed yourself tonight? It, it was pleasant. This Mr. Thurston, he is charming, isn't he, my dear? He's very nice. But naturally he would be. You didn't mind my going to dinner with him, did you, darling? <laughs> ah, Cherie, you are lovely, you are generous, you are sweet. But, ma petite, you are also very naive. Huh? Listen to me. This man, this Thurston, he didn't just happen to be in Paris, you know. But it's you. He didn't come to Paris, my angel, only because you are here. He came to Paris because he is the man called X. No matter how many toothpaste you tried, no matter how good a job you think your present brand is doing, change now to the new Pepsodent toothpaste. And in just one week, see if you don't find new brightness in your teeth, new sparkle in your smile. Yes, there's a new improved Pepsodent toothpaste now with a cleaner, brighter taste that means cleaner, brighter teeth. You see, new Pepsodent has twice as much irium, the exclusive cleansing ingredient that Pepsodent and only Pepsodent can give you. New Pepsodent with twice as much irium removes the film that makes your teeth look dull. It loosens film and floats it away, quickly, easily, safely. So new Pepsodent brings new brightness to your teeth. It cleans better between teeth, leaves your breath cleaner, fresher too. No wonder more people than ever before are using Pepsodent today. So despite any other brand you've tried, Change now to new, improved Pepsodent toothpaste. And in just one week, see the difference. See if your teeth don't feel cleaner, look brighter. See how Pepsodent uncovers the natural brilliance of your smile. And now to return to Pepsodent's Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. Mr. X has gone to Paris because a beautiful lady kissed him in the lobby of a New York theater. That is because the lady, Leonore Barrill, was wearing a lavalier, which Mr. X identified as part of the missing Rotterdam collection. In turn, Leonore's fiancé, Etienne Safier, has been identified. Ken Kirsten is the man called X. So now the score is even. But Mr. X does not know this. At the moment, he's in his Paris hotel room when there's a knock. Yeah, come in. Hello, Mr. Thurston. I thought you were leaving Paris, Pagan. On the contrary, Mr. Thurston, Paris. I love it as much as in the summer as in the spring. Well, Paris will be glad to know that. <laughs> Mr. X, I'm happy to inform you, but I warn you it'll cost you money. When didn't it? Mr. X, would you be interested in a stick pin? Not particularly. I mean a lady's stick pin. Mm, that depends upon the lady. 
Uh, if it was a fleur de lis set with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds? Congratulations, Pagan. On, hand it over. I haven't got it. <laughs> but you could get it if you had the money. Of course, and, and a set of earrings to match. Oh, Mr. Thurston, it's scandalous, the prices they're asking. Plus your commission. They won't even dilly-dilly. It's a quick deal, you know, cash under the table or nothing. Who is it, Pagan? Somebody you don't like. Oh? In fact, you punched him in the nose once. Well. He didn't, rec didn't recognize me, but, but that doesn't matter because he works for another man. By the name of Safia. Yes, by the name of... How did you know? My spies, Pagan. Mr. X, you have somebody else working for you. How could you? Well, for one thing, she's more beautiful than you are. Mr. X! Scram, Pagan, now, will you go, please? But I just... Shut up. You want that commission? Get out of here quickly, the back way. Commission? In that case, Mr. Thurston. And no eavesdropping. Come in. Leonore. Are you busy, Ken? Come in. This is more than I'd hoped for. Please sit down. I hate to see you. Fine. I'm, I'm confused. I mean, I had to talk to someone. Can it's finished between Atia and me? Leonor. He's jealous, Ken, of you. Because I took you out to dinner? I, I've been honest with you, haven't I? Yes. I've been honest with Etienne also. I cannot lie. I cannot dissemble. Etienne could read the truth in my eyes at once. You know what I'm trying to say, Ken? Or must I? Must do what? Darling. Darling, don't make me say it. Darling? Yes, Ken, from that first moment. I didn't realize until I tasted it for me. With that first kiss, the whole world turned inside out. There was nothing left but you. Leonor. That first kiss. I was just pretending then. But Ken, I don't want to pretend anymore. Darling, darling, darling. Nevertheless, my sweet, that was an awfully good job of pretending. Ken. You are still pretending, aren't you? Well, what do you mean, Ken? Is it about time you told me the real reason for all this? You don't believe me? No. I hate you. I don't believe that either. <laughs> don't, Leonor. No, I don't hate you, Ken. But you were told that you should hate me, weren't you? Now, you don't have to answer. Just, just listen. Ever see this ring before? Ring? It matches my lover here. Yes. And with a little trouble and a good deal more money, I'm sure I could produce a pin and probably earrings to fill out the set. What are you trying to tell me? Will you mind the outline of a long story? Go on, Ken. It starts in 1940. A million dollars in jewels disappeared in the ruins of Rotterdam. Rotterdam. That. That ring. That Lavalier. Go on. I'll go back a few years. In 1932, the Countess Lamoureux lost a diamond at her Riviera Villa, an extraordinary stone that should have been in a museum. A man was accused, but evidence was only circumstantial, and he was acquitted. Sometime later, in 1936, Lord Larchmont's Fabulous emerald-headed cane was stolen at Brighton. A man was held, but later released for lack of evidence. I could give you other instances if you want. Same man? Same man. Different names. I could show you his photograph if you wish. No, Ken. Oh, I've been very cheap. I came here to... He wanted me... Oh, there's no reason for you to believe me, but... I didn't know. I believe you. Here, Leonore, will you, will you wear this ring? But I... Memory of a kiss? Okay. <laughs> well, Leonore? Is it me? And how did our inquisitive friend, Mr. X, respond to your blandishments? 
I don't know, Etienne. Don't know? Come now, Leonor, surely you could tell that. Did he ask any leading questions? Question? About me. He knows about you, Etienne. So? He knows, he knows you're my fiancé. Oh. Did he by any chance mention that lavalier? Oh, well, yes. Yes? He thought it was very beautiful. Is that all? Well? He said it was very beautiful. You told me that. Here. Let me see it. Take off that lavalier. But you gave it to me, Etienne. Are you afraid I won't return it, my chérie? Oh, no, Etienne. may have. <laughs> Where did you get that? What? You know what I'm talking about, that ring. Tell me, where did you get it? I tell you, you're hurting me. Where did you get that ring? <laughs> he wanted me to wear it. Oh. Right. Out with it. What does he know? Etienne, please. Does he know why I gave you that lovely ad- Why I sent you to America? I don't know why you did. No, you don't. But you served me well without knowing. Now that you do know, uh, my precious, it is a treasure. It is. It is. Oh, no. Thurston, you, what you the... Ride on the schnozola, Mr. X. He's out cold. Tell the gendarmes to come in, Pagan. With pleasure. You know, I... I don't know why it is, Leonore, but every time I'm with you, I... I seem to poke somebody in the nose. Mr. X, I've been knocking my brain in trying to figure out why that man gave the lady the lavalier since he wanted to sell it. It was the easiest way to get it to America. Once she was there, a stooge could steal it from her and Sapphire would still be in the clear. If only she hadn't kissed you, eh? That, Pagon, is what is called one of the imponderable factors in the case. A funny name for a kiss. Come in, Leonore. I'm not Leonore. By golly, you're not, are you, Chief? Nice flight over? Delightful. I just couldn't wait to get here and find out what you've been doing. You got here just in time. Oh. Great work, Kim. Great work. Now, what do we do? You can have your choice. The bowel mask. The Moulin Rouge. Huh? Don't worry, Chief. I'll line up a beautiful evening for you. That is, if Leonore can find a friend. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment to tell you about next week's exploit of the man called X. But first, a word about Pepsodent. Try it. Taste it. Compare it. Change now to a new Pepsodent toothpaste, and in just one week, see the difference. Yes, new Pepsodent has a cleaner, brighter taste that means cleaner, brighter teeth. New Pepsodent toothpaste with twice as much irium removes the film that makes your teeth look dull, uncovers the natural brilliance of your smile. And our Pepsodent star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Next week, Mr. X is slipping away to a quiet little island off the coast of Maine to enjoy a peaceful vacation, sleep, rest, a little fishing, perhaps. Ah, yes, there are four nice ladies, two of them young and very beautiful. All very idyllic. But you know what happens when a passman takes a holiday. As usual, Leon Velasco's pagan will come along and complicate matters. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. President's Man Called X is written by Milton Merlin with music composed and personally conducted by Felix Mills. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. So until next week, same time, same station, this is Wendell Niles reminding you to change to Pepsodent toothpaste now. For Pepsodent, and only Pepsodent, contains irium. Mr. Herbert Marshall is soon to be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, The Razor's Edge. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental.
is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Subscribe for more videos. America's number one adventurer, K-7, former United States secret agent who operated in 22 countries, on land, on sea, and in the air, brings you another story of today. Here is K-7. Ladies and gentlemen, undoubtedly you have read much about fortified borders during the past year. Pictures of these modern spite fences between nations have appeared in publications. Not only one, but many nations now possess them, or they are building them. Are they new? Many seem to believe they are. Yet, they are as old as the Great Wall of China. John Holbrook will introduce the story of a modern plot involving the mining of such a barrier. Thank you, K-7. Fortified borders have always had one great weakness. They can be mined and blown up. K-7 and his friend Agent Z were in active service when Kemmel Hill was blown up during the World War. That experience led Agent Z to work swiftly when the case, now to be dramatized, came to his attention. Our story opens as two men study a map. Here's the map of the border. The red line shows where the fortifications will be put in. You are sure this map is accurate? It is an exact copy of the approved plans. The plans were photographed for us in the Department of Military Information. This plan was drawn from the photographs. Yeah, but what is your plan? It is simple, my friend. Work on the border has already been started to the north. Now, look at this spot. Yes. It has been surveyed by military engineers, but work will not begin for at least three months. Do you see this hill? But yes, of course. It is a vital point. The fortifications are to be heaviest here. The entire hill is to be hollowed out. When the work is completed, that hill will contain the air conditioning equipment ammunition cellars, officers' quarters, and telephone headquarters. It will be the nerve center. That is very interesting. We are going to mine that hill before actual construction on the border starts. Then we will sell our work. Think what it will mean. When we are finished, a button can be pushed in the city hundreds of miles away, and the nerve center of the border will be blown to bits. Yes. It will be worth at least $5 million to us. Perhaps more. Now, follow me closely. Do you see this farmhouse sketched on the map? Yes, yes. It is deserted and at the foot of the hill. We begin work there. The river is within a few feet of the door. The dirt which we dig out of our tunnel can be disposed of in the river. It is a perfect plan, Shostak. This will be George Shostak's masterpiece, Peyton. When we are finished, and the hill is mined, I will retire. When shall we start? Tomorrow night. The plan was perfect. The border was to be mined before the fortifications were built. However, there was a slip. The traitor in the Office of Military Information, who had made the photographs of the plans, was found using his camera again. He was secretly seized and questioned. The information which he gave brought Agent Z into the case. 
Z and his assistant, Patricia Norwood, began their investigation at once. What an afternoon you picked to come out here, Z. Well, I picked it deliberately, Pat. We don't want to be seen. If it storms, so much the better. Um, let me try and help you with that heavy case. Oh, it's all right. I can handle it. We're almost at the top of the hill. Yeah. This is the spot. Are you going to set the sound detector up now? Oh, no, not until night. I'll conceal it in these bushes. There. There, that hides it. Now we'll have a look around. It's peaceful enough, Z. I can't believe that within a few short months, this hill will be bristling with guns. Yes, it'll have more than guns, Pat. This hill will be the nerve center of the entire border. Across that river below us lies another country. There'll be fortifications there, too. It's horrible to think of. Yes, and even worse to think that tonight there may be men burrowing beneath where we're standing. Burrowing to plant mines that'll explode and kill other men whom they've never even seen. Now, come on, Pat. We've got work to do. You're sure this is the place? Uh, there's no doubt about that. The trader who sold the plans to George Shostak broke down completely. He told everything he knew. Our job is to find out first if Shostak has started work. Then we've got to capture him and take the copy of the plans from him. Z, yes? look at the river. Uh, it's muddy from the rain this morning. But it's yellow mud, and the soil along the banks is black. Oh, what's that? Pat, you're right. I didn't notice. Black soil, and yet the water is yellow. And it doesn't extend above this point. Look at the river. What does it mean? It may mean that you've discovered something, Pat. We've got three hours before night. First, I'm going to have a look around. Then we're going to take samples of that river water and analyze it. A few hours later, Z is in his laboratory. He looks up from a powerful microscope he's using. Pat, you made a vital discovery when you noticed the yellow color of the river. That yellow color was caused by dirt dug from far underground. You're sure? I'm positive. It's the yellow clay. One of the peasants told me they always struck yellow clay when they dug a deep well. Then it means that someone is digging. Unless I'm mistaken, it means that George Shostak is at work. Now we'll get started back to the hill. If our sound detector confirms what this yellow clay seems to prove, well, we'll find out within a few hours. Get ready, Pat. We're going back. Under cover of darkness, Pat and Z again made their way to the top of the hill. There, Z set up his sound detector, a delicate instrument that picks up sound that cannot be heard by human ears. Can you see what you're doing, Z? Hmm? It's so black tonight. Uh, it's a perfect night for us, Pat. We can't afford to use a flashlight. It might be seen. I'll have this working in a minute. Will we be able to hear them at work under us? We will if they're down there. This machine is like a delicate pair of ears, Pat. It'll pick up the slightest sound. Oh, something like those machines with huge horns they use in anti-aircraft work? The ones that pick up the sound of airplanes approaching at night? Yes, yeah, something like them, Pat. There's a small speaker here in this cabinet. The machine is tuned to something like a radio. If there are men digging a tunnel under us, we'll hear the sound of their picks and shovels. I see. Now, almost ready. I'll snap this switch on first. It's working. Now, let's see what we can find by tuning. What does that mean? Uh, nothing yet. There's something. Now, if I can tune it in. They're down there. Uh, there's no doubt about it, Pat. George Shostak has started his tunnel. Have you a pistol with you? Yes. Good. Now, I want you to stay here. I'm going down by the riverbank and travel along it until I find where that clay that colors the water is being carried out. But, Z, yes? it's so black tonight. If anything should happen to you, I wouldn't know where to find no, you. No, nothing will happen. I want you to stay right here by the sound detector, and if I need you, I'll fire two shots. If you hear shots, come at once. I will. Be careful. Don't you worry about me, Pat. Just stay there unless you hear two shots. Z reached the bank of the river and made his way slowly downstream in the blackness. His eyes grew used to the night, and to his left he saw the outlines of the deserted farmhouse. Uh, farmhouse. No lights. Deserted. Just the kind of a place Shostak would pick. Uh, doesn't seem to be anybody around. 
I think I'll have a look inside. Here's the porch. Who's there? Answer me. Answer me or I'll shoot. Stop. Stop. Do you hear me? Stop. Major. Yeah. Who's just there? What happened? I heard shots. They were mine. I heard something. He was on the porch. I shot twice. Was it the man? I don't know. I called. No one answered. Then I shot. Something ran into the bushes. An animal, probably, you fool. No. You want us to be heard? I will stay with you for a minute. He's calling you two out of the tunnel. But I'm sure I heard something. I can't see tonight. Z? <laughs> Z, where are you? There's someone. Listen. Z, fire again. There's a girl. She's coming. Z, Z, are you here? She's a... Ow! <laughs> Let me go. Who are you? I was about to ask you that same question, mademoiselle. What are you doing here? I was looking for someone. Obviously. But for whom? For, for my brother. He's... He's just a boy. He he was out hunting this afternoon. He, he didn't come home. I, I heard the shot. You lie, Mamsel. It, it's the truth. I've been looking for him ever since it got dark. I heard the shots and thought he was signaling. Let's take her inside and see what she looks like, Shostak. Sh so, you know my name, Mamsel. Yes, Peyton. I think we had better look at her. She is probably a spy. Open the door. Yes. Uh, wait. Did you hear that? There was a signal. Stand still. He cannot be seen. Mamsel, if you attempt to move... We should get away. There will be time for that. Keep the girl between us. If you try to run, Mamsel... Shostak, I won't try to run. I have a gun in your back. You... If you move or that man Peyton moves, I'll shoot. You should have searched me, Shostak. Look, a flashlight. It's on us. And you're both covered. This place is surrounded. Uh, you all right, Pat? Yes, Z. I'm holding a gun in Shostak's back. Here, wait a minute. I'll handcuff him together. Who are you? It's the police. Your man is partially right, Shostak. I'm Special Agent Z. You're both under arrest. Z, there are others below us working in the tunnel. Shostak mentioned them. Is this place really surrounded? No, not yet. But it will be in another ten minutes. But the signal, the whistle. I blew that, Pat, to make them think there were more of us. When this man Payton fired at me, I knew you'd hear the shots and come. We arranged two shots as a signal. I got away and telephoned for help. I wondered. We'll stay here quietly until that help arrives. Shostak? Perhaps I can amuse you by telling you some stories about your old friend, K-7. You, you know K-7? Very well. I'll send up a cable tomorrow morning. A cable saying, George Shostak is again in prison. This time, he'll be tried as a spy. George Shostak has been a spy and international crook since the days before the World War. And now I leave you with this thought. Contrast our position in North America with that of the other nations. They erect fortified borders between themselves and their neighbors. Canada and the United States have a border thousands of miles long, and there is no fort or fortification. Our countries are friendly neighbors who live in peace with each other, as all nations could, if they so will. Listen for my next story. This is K-7 speaking.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. The National Broadcasting Company brings you Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell in... Dangerous Assignment. The time, midnight. The place, a carnival on the outskirts of Zurich, Switzerland. Two men slip furtively through the shadows near the slowly revolving carousel. They stare intently into the darkness. Triflis must be around here somewhere, Carl. Yeah, handsome. We both saw him enter the carnival grounds. Well, where could he hide? The carnival is almost deserted. You see, there's only one person riding on the carousel and... Carl! Carl, it is he, Triflis, right on the rod nose. Yeah, riding on the carousel. Good. We wait and we will ride right into our arms. He sees us. Come on. Hanson, drag him from the carousel. No, no. Grab him. Grab him. Yeah, yeah, I have him. No, let go of me. Let go. Carl, drag him into the shadows no. here. Yeah. The American document, Triflis. Where is it? I, I do not know what you're talking about. The one they called File 307. You sold it to Bruner, didn't you, Triflis? Didn't you? I... Yes, to Bruno. In that case, you will not live to spend the money. No, no. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Not my throat. I, I can't breathe. Yeah, no. Exactly. Oh. More pressure, Carl. I, I... A little more, Carl. I cannot squeeze any tighter. Uh. It is enough pressure. Just hold it a moment here. So... I think that is enough. Yes. You may let him go now, Carl. You've seen him in such pictures as an American romance. The Great McGinty and Command Decision. Now, here is our star, Brian Donlevy, in another two-fisted portrayal as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. Ruth, you've got the worst sense of timing I ever saw. You're always dragging me back here to the office when I'm right in the middle of a big deal. Maybe she was a big deal to you, Steve, but she looked more like a stacked deck to me. You know, some of these gals may start picketing you. What's this all about, anyway? That's what the commissioner is waiting in his office to tell you. Here we are. I have your passport and credentials ready when you are. Okay, thanks, Ruth. Oh, Steve. Hello, commissioner. Well, where am I going this time? Zurich, Switzerland. Switzerland? Look. I can't even yodel. You won't have time to yodel. Steve, ever heard the name Bruner before? Bruner? Sounds vaguely familiar. Who is he, Commissioner? I don't know. Huh? Bruner's always been a very mysterious figure, Steve. None of our agents has ever seen him. Matter of fact, I don't suppose there are more than a handful of people in the entire world who know what he looks like. Yeah, I remember now. Bruner's a sort of an international mystery man who sells information to the highest bidder. We think Bruner has file 307, Steve. File 307? Top secret document containing defense plans. Two weeks ago, it was stolen from this country. Oh, you think it's in Zurich now? We had information it was temporarily in the possession of a seamy little man named Triflis. This morning, his body was discovered near a carnival grounds outside of Zurich. Mm. Needless to say, file 307 wasn't on Triflis's body. No, but Triflis paid a visit to Bruner's villa two hours before he was murdered. We think he sold file 307 to Bruner. Mm. And I'm supposed to get it back from this international secret seller, huh? Great. Well, have we got any contacts in Zurich? One. His name is Max Raber. He runs the carnival over there. Mm. Just uh, one more thing, Steve, as to the danger involved. Yeah, I don't imagine trying to get into Bruner's villa is a habit-forming occupation. There's more than that. Other interests are also trying to get file 307 from Bruner. Naturally, they'll try to stop you permanently. Their agents may be watching you right from the start. Yeah. Well, that's it, Steve. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent after an interview with Bruner. Actually, you ought to find file 307 and bring it back. You've got your assignment. Good luck. Steve Mitchell departed.
entered United States for Zurich, apparently on assignment as foreign correspondent. Keep him under surveillance, find out his real mission. Very well, Mr. Mitchell. We will try to give you a very cordial reception here in Zurich. Taxi? Oh, okay, driver. Kenny Hotel. Yes, sir. You're an American, sir. Yeah. On a uh, vacation, perhaps? Not exactly. Well, I'm a good guide, sir. I can show you the points of interest here in Zurich. Never mind. I'm afraid I won't have much time for sightseeing. No, wait a minute. Uh, yes, sir? There's a large villa a couple of kilometers outside of the city. Got a high wall around it. You know where it is? Why, I think I can find it, sir. Okay. When you get me to the hotel, wait for me. I'll want you to take me out to that villa. I will be very happy to, sir. Hello, Carl. This is Hanson speaking. I've just brought Mitchell to the Koenig Hotel from the airport. I'm waiting for him now. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't suspect me. He thinks I'm just a cab driver. He wants me to take him to Buna's villa, so he's after file 307, all right. Now listen, Carl, there is a Max Reber who runs the carnival. They might be working together. If Mitchell tries to contact Reber, you know what to do. <laughs> This might be the villa you are looking for, sir. It is the only one with a high wall near here. Well, that must be it, then. Okay, here you are. Oh, but uh, I can wait for you, sir. Never mind. Very well, sir. If you should need me further, my name is Hanson, and my cab is usually in front of your hotel. Oh? You're quite an obliging guy, aren't you, Hanson? Sir? I'll skip it. Thanks. <laughs> Some joint. Looks like a penitentiary. Oh, there ought to be a gatekeeper around here somewhere. Hmm. Who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? One at a time. I'm Steve Mitchell, foreign correspondent from the United States. What do you want? An interview with Brunner. Go away. Now look. You cannot see Bruno. Bruno gives interviews to no one. Go away. Yeah, what is it, Cam? Well, this villa is getting better looking by the minute. What's the matter, Fritz? This man wants to see Bruna. Oh? I'm Bruna's secretary, Karen. Hello. You're Mr. The Steve Mitchell. You're Bruna's secretary? <laughs> you should be so lucky. You can go, Fritz. I'll take care of this. Very well, Cam. But don't let him get into the gate. Much cozier with just the two of us, isn't it? Just what was it you wanted, Mr. Mitchell? I'm a newspaper correspondent. No. Oh. Well, I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, then. Your boss isn't too eager when it comes to giving out interviews, huh, Karen? Bruno sees no one, Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, that's the general impression I've gotten, but I thought he might possibly make an exception in my case. You say you wish a story? That's right. And that's all you wish here? Well, it was before I met you. <sighs> I mean, a story is all you wish from Bruno? <laughs> what else would I be after? I do not know. Suppose you come back tomorrow, Mr. Mitchell. Tomorrow? Yes. I will tell Bruno about you and ask him if he will see you. Why, thanks. You'd be doing me a big favor, Karen. All right, Mr. Mitchell. I will try to persuade him. Until tomorrow, then. Hi. Is the boss around? The boss? Yeah, the guy who runs this carnival. You mean Max Reber? That his name? I'd like to talk to him. Where is he? Over there, standing at the shooting gallery. The short man with the gun in his hand. Okay. Nice shot. Thank you. I seldom miss. Oh. 
Hey, looks like you know what you're talking about. You, uh, Max Reber? That is correct. I'm Steve Mitchell. <laughs> you missed. The name mean anything to you? A name is for anyone who cares to use it. That's right. But these credentials aren't. Do you mind squinting down your peep sight at them? Put them away. <laughs> the commissioner sent you, Mitchell? Yeah. He said you might be able to help me. You're after fire 307. Yeah. You any information on it? I think the person they call Bruna has it. Yeah, it looks that way. The guy who had it before him turned up dead near your carnival, didn't he? You missed again, Max. Perhaps because you're crowding me, Mitchell. Oh, sorry. Go to 25 Bolligstrasse and wait for me. As soon as I close the carnival for the night, we'll talk further. 25 Brolichstrasse. Right. Only six hits out of eight. I am slipping. That's slipping? Look, Raver, do me a favor. What? Don't ever point that gun at me. <laughs> 21. 23. Here it is. 25 Brolichstrasse. dark. Unlocked. Well, Max has to wait here for him. I wonder where the lights are. Hey, who closed the door? What? In just a moment, our star Brian Don Levy returns as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. The United States is now building the largest, best-trained peacetime armed forces in its history. Our United Services, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard are training a new kind of serviceman, training him in the greatest scientific enterprise in the world. Yesterday, he was a man of weapons. Today, to a large degree, he's a man of science. Yes, a brilliant future in technology is available to America's young men in the new armed forces. So remember, the time for the future is now. Find it in the Armed Forces of the United States. Now, the National Broadcasting Company brings you Act Two of Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell. Time, one hour later. The place, the police station in Zurich, Switzerland. Oh. So, we're coming around at last. What? Oh. The head, it hurts, huh? The head, it hurts, huh? Hey, this looks like a jail. It is. Uh. I am Police Inspector Baumgartner. Police? Jail? Look, I don't get it. Neither do we. When we found you four kilometers west of the city, I... Did... How did I get four kilometers west of the city? Last I remember was walking in a house at 25 Brolichstrasse and getting hit on the head. One of our policemen saw a cab with two men in it traveling at high speed out of the city. He gave chase. The men finally abandoned the cab. When the policeman got to it, he found you lying on the floor unconscious. Uh, remind me to thank him. Looks like I was getting taken for the well-known ride when he came along. Eh? Skip it. Say there were two men in the cab. Whose cab was it? We are checking that. Why? Well, I was just thinking about a very eager cab driver named Hansen who wanted to show me the sights around Zurich. Now it is my turn <clears throat> to ask the questions. What were you doing at 25 Brolichstrasse? I was sent there by... Hey. By a carnival owner I thought was a friend of mine. Incidentally, is there a telegraph office around here? You're down the street. Hey, Mitchell... Your credentials are those of a newspaper correspondent. May I inquire what you are really doing here in Zurich? It's very simple, Inspector. I'm trying to get an interview with a mysterious character named Brunner. Brunner? Herr Mitchell, a word of advice. You are apparently involved with very dangerous people. It might be better for you to give it up. Oh? Well, thanks for the advice. I'd sleep on it, except it's almost morning. Yeah, you sleep on it, Herr Mitchell. Only be sure you're able to wake up. May I inquire what you are really doing here in Zurich? 
It's very simple, Inspector. I'm trying to get an interview with a mysterious character named Brunner. Brunner. Herr Mitchell, a word of advice. You are apparently involved with very dangerous people. It might be better for you to give it up. Oh? Well, thanks for the advice. I'd sleep on it, except it's almost morning. Yeah, you sleep on it, Herr Mitchell. Only be sure you're able to wake up, huh? It's from Steve, Commissioner. Good. I've been expecting a report from him. Here you are. Oh, thanks, Ruth. File 307, apparently in Bruna's possession. His beautiful secretary, Karen, trying to arrange appointment for interview. Just between us, would rather interview Karen... Huh? <laughs> he never changes, does he? Apparently, Max Raber, not such hot friend of ours after all. I'm still nursing large lump on head, which I collected at a dress Raber sent me to. What? I don't understand, Commissioner. I thought Max Raber could be trusted. I guess in this business you never know, Ruth. Oh, there's some more coming in. We'll pay Raber another visit this morning when his carnival opens up. In the meantime, I'm going back to Bruner's villa. We'll keep you informed. Well, this is quite an apartment you've got here, Karen. Much better than trying to talk through the bars of that gate outside. Yes, it is a nice apartment. Bruna takes good care of me. You know something? He should. <laughs> you say nice things, Steve. Sometimes it comes easy. I'm afraid it won't do you any good to look out the window, Steve. You won't see Bruna. Oh? He lives in that other wing, across the courtyard. Mm. Look, uh, what kind of a guy is he, anyway? Mm, a short little man. Very quiet. A short man? A fascinating man to work for. I can imagine. Steve, mm. I talked to him last evening about you. He doesn't believe you. What do you mean? Well, he doesn't believe it's just an interview you want. Oh? What else would I be after? He's not sure yet. But uh, supposing you were after a story. Bruna's interested in knowing just how much you would be willing to pay for it. We're uh, talking about the story, of course. Of course. Well, that's sort of a tough question to answer offhand. You see, there are others anxious to, uh, shall we say, write a story about Bruna. They are willing to pay a great deal. Yeah, I'll bet they are. And, uh, well, Bruna knows a lot more about you than you think, Steve. He knows you cannot pay as much for it as others can. I see. Well, if Bruner knows so much about me, maybe he also knows that the story we're talking about used to belong to the people I worked for. Yes, he knows that. But I'm afraid it does not make any difference to him. He says he cannot do business with you. Well, that's that, I guess. I'm sorry, Steve. So am I. Anyway, it was very nice of you to go to the trouble. I was glad to. I don't quite get why you've been so nice to me. Well, I... I guess I... You what? Well, I, I stay here in Bruna's villa most of the time... I don't see many people. And I've never seen anyone like... I mean, you were... Oh, I, I don't know what I mean. Maybe this is what you mean, Karen. Oh, Steve. You... You must leave, Steve. Okay. But I'll be back. No, Steve. They would not let you in. There's a high wall and guards. Look... I said I'd see you later, and I will. With you here, I could grow wings. No, Max Reber's not here. Where is he? I do not know. Oh, he should have been here by now to open up the carnival. Yeah? Where does he live? At 25 Brolichstrasse. What? Max Reber lives at 25 Brolichstrasse? Yeah. Do you know where it is? Yeah. I've got lumps to prove it. Thanks. Well, Mitchell, here we go again. 25 Rolex Strasser. Hey, 
Sounds like a fight inside. Mitchell, help me. Get these men off me. Mitchell. <laughs> it's the eager cab driver. Kyle, let's get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Too late, Hanson. I will take care of this one, Mitchell. Hey, you sure did take care of him, Reba. For a little guy, you sure swing a mean limb. Yeah, it's good you arrived when you did, Mitchell. Five minutes more would have been too late. You know, maybe I was wrong about you, Max. Wrong? What do you mean, Mitchell? I had you pegged as the boy arranged that hit on the head for me here last night. Oh, I told you to come here and wait for me. When I got here, you disappeared. I got taken for a ride. Maybe by these two guys on the floor here, Hanson and... and what's the other one's name? Hanson called him Carl, I think. Yeah. Why'd they jump you just now? They know that we're working together. That we're after File 307. They are also after it. Look, I'm going to need your help. Have you ever seen Brunner? No. But I've been watching his villa carefully the last few days. I think I know a way we can get into the grounds. Good. At one place, in the rear of the villa, there's a tree which overhangs the walls. It looks like a difficult climb, but perhaps we can make it. Okay. We'll tie these two apes up and leave them here for the present. And after dark, you and I will pay a little call on our friend Brunner. <laughs> Here, Max. Take my hand. I'll pull you up to this next branch. Yeah, Steve. Mm, thank you. Well, we're almost to the top. There. Now, I'll drop down inside of the wall first. Then you follow, okay? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. Come ahead, Max. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Look, Mitchell. The lights in that wing of the building across the courtyard. Yeah, that's what Karen says Brunner lives. We'll work our way over there and try to get in. Steve, listen. Oh, great. The hound of the Baskervilles. Look, Steve, a giant black dog coming for us. Yeah, I see him. Well, that just about cooks us. No, wait. Get lost, Reba. Huh? Lost? Get under the brushes there. Watch where they take me and try to get to me later. Now get moving. All right, Steve. Hey, get away from me, you big lug. Hey, will somebody get the black monster off of me? Kitty streets over against the wall. Hurry up. This dog guts me on his manual. So, it is the nosy reporter. Get this timber wolf off me. Stop get the dog. Rich, take this man to the room in the cellar and tie him up at once. <laughs> Who's there? Steve? Karen. They told me you'd been captured in the grounds. How long have you been lying here in the cellar? I don't know. Uh, half an hour, I guess. You should not have tried to come back, Steve. You're sorry I did, Karen? Oh, Steve. I'm afraid for you. Look, just get me untied. I, I cannot do that, Steve. What? Now, look, Angel. Fun is fun. Bruno would kill me if I did a thing like that. Look, you let me worry about Bruno. Oh, I cannot untie you now. I must get back right away or they will become suspicious. But, well, perhaps I can come back later. Come here. Okay. But make it sooner instead of later. I'll try, Steve. This is a great spot you got yourself in, Mitchell. Steve. Max, how long have you been in the next room? For several minutes. Here, I'll untie you. Good. I would have come in sooner, but from what I could hear, you were not very anxious to be rescued. Uh, yeah. Look, you know your way around this villa pretty well, don't you, Max? What do you mean? Finding these rooms in the cellar without much trouble. I told you I've been watching this villa the last few days. You're pretty short, too, aren't you? I, I do not understand. Karen told me Brunner was short. Don't let your imagination run away with you. I'm trying not to. How did you get in here so easily, anyway? I diverted their attention by setting a fire in the yard. A fire in the... Hey, hey, hey. you believe in doing things up brown, don't you? Yeah. Mm. Last of the knots. Come on, Steve. Yeah. Out of the side door into the hall. Hey, no guards. No, they're probably all fighting the fire out in the yard. Come, up these stairs. We'll try to get over the back wall while their attention is diverted. Over the wall? Look, I came to this villa after file 307, and I'm not leaving until I get it. Steve, that's impossible. We would be lucky to escape with our lives to continue the search for the document that would mean certain death for both of us. Well, you get the scourge too easy. This is the door to the yard? Yeah. All clear. Come on. 
Hey, that really is a fire you started. Come, Mitchell. It's spreading toward the front gate. It's our chance to get over the back wall. Hey, wait a minute, Max. We're not leaving yet. What? Look, that building over there. It's Brunner's wing of the villa. Steve, are you crazy? We cannot get in there. Why not? The door's open. This is our big chance, Reba. But Steve, I tell Look, you... Look, I came all the way across the Atlantic to find that piece of paper. Come on. Anybody spot us? I don't think so. They're all fighting the flames. Okay, let's get inside. Close the door. Yeah. Bruno must be out at the fire too, Steve. Yeah. Brother. I thought Karen's apartment was something. This one looks like the Waldorf Astoria. Well, come on, let's go through some of these drawers. But Steve, if the document's in here, it's probably in a safe. You can't tell. Brunner might figure a safe would be the obvious place. Hey, what have you found? Silk stockings and negligee, Steve. Yeah, me too. I don't get it. I would... Wait huh? a minute. Boy, I'm really slipping, Max. Sure took me a long time to catch on. Steve, look, this leather case. Give it to me. Hmm. Someone's coming. What? Here, put the case back in that drawer. Hurry. Yeah. Well, Steve. Karen Brunner. Complete with gun. Karen Brunner? I see you've discovered my little secret. I should have figured it. You're not Brunner's secretary. You're Brunner. You're lucky, Steve. Lucky that I feel a certain affection for you. Otherwise, your discovery would have cost you your life. Steve, stay away from that drawer. Another step and I'll shoot. Okay, Karen. I lose. That's better. You were... Yes. You were getting very warm, Steve. So close to the right drawer. And yet so far. Yeah. Well, what happens now, Karen? I told you. You were lucky. I'm going to let you go. But you'd better go now. Okay. Well, it was nice while it lasted, baby. Yes, it was. And it would be something to remember when you're back in America. That even though Karen Bruner was a little too clever for you, she almost fell in love with you. Goodbye, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner. Ruth said you wanted to see me as soon as I got back. I certainly do, Steve. I got the cable you sent from Zurich before you left. So Karen, the beautiful secretary, turned out to be Bruner. She sure did. Steve, you let me down badly. Huh? Letting a woman razzle-dazzle you like that. But I finally figured out she was Bruner, Commissioner. Yes, but too late. Not quite. I didn't mention it in my cable, but here. What's that? File 307. What? That's what you sent me over there to get, isn't it? Why, yeah, yes, but... I... I, I don't understand. <laughs> you see, I'd found the papers and stuck them in my shirt before she walked in. And when I made a pass at the drawer where they'd been, she figured they were still there. I give up, Steve, of all the... <laughs> yeah. Karen was a razzle-dazzle artist, but she forgot the two can play that kind of football. I guess she'd never run into the hidden ball play before. Yeah. So long, Commissioner. <laughs> You have just heard the seventh in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif and directed by Bill Karn, with music by Bruce Ashley. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. The 
makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That was the report of leading throat specialists in a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people, people with normal throats who smoked only camels for 30 days. Start your own 30-day camel test tonight. Smoke only camels for 30 days. You'll discover how rich and flavorful camels are, and you'll learn how well camels will agree with your throat. Pack after pack, week after week. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, your crime is my crime. Oh, no. Hi-ho, Helen. Oh, Rick, honestly. The slogans are bad enough, but must you set them to music? Now, dear, dear, this is the age of the singing commercial. Keep with the times, kid. Mm, I'm the gal who could have married a Yale man, and what do I pick? A singing detective. Well, you just appreciate the finer things of life, Helen. Hang up and call me back. What? Just thought of a new slogan. Oh, Rick, you can preview your new slogan tonight. You are coming over tonight, aren't you? I are. Well, so agreeable. This can only mean one thing. You haven't got a client. Oh, Helen, you're so fiendishly clever. Seriously, Rick. I'll be expecting you at seven. And just once, try to be on time. Now, that is a challenge. But I... Oh, bless my little square head. Mm, I might have known it. Client? Even more surprising. Rick, I'm in no mood for jokes. It's Lieutenant Walter Levinson, dear, and he's no mood for jokes. The old grouch. What's Walt doing there? No, I'll ask him. What are you doing here, Walt? Rick, this is serious business. Finish your conversation, then we'll talk. Oh. What did he say? Honey, I'd better hang up. For once, Walt isn't kidding. See you at seven. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rick. Well, what's it all about, Fatty? I haven't seen you look like this for a long time. I was in the neighborhood. I thought I'd stop by and tell you the news myself. A punk named Smiley Brill shot one of our cops, Rick. Oh, Smiley Brill, huh? Didn't know a punk like Smiley had the nerve to pull a trigger. Cop caught him breaking into a pawn shop. Smiley got scared and fired. Uh-huh. Well, Walt, I'm sorry to hear this, but I, I don't get it. Why act like a lost soul? Lots of cops get shot up. They take that chance when they put on a badge. I know that, Rick. This cop was Ben Johnson. What? Come again, Walt. Johnson, Rick. Ben Johnson. <laughs> There are times when words can't describe a feeling. This was one of those times. Years ago, when I was a green rookie cop, I made lots of mistakes, got discouraged. But old Ben Johnson always took me under his wing and helped me over the rough spots. Ben helped a lot of rookies like me, and everyone knew it and loved him for it. Yeah, now I knew why Walt's expression looked like the world had ended, and I wasn't glad I knew. Happened early this morning, Rick. Uh, where's Ben now? General Hospital. Doc gives him a 50-50 chance. Well, what about Smiley Brill? You got him? No. I set up a dragnet, but he's slimy. He might slip through. Rick, I was hoping maybe you'd like to help us get him. Well, you know I will, Walt. Only if I find him, I won't guarantee you'll get him in one piece. Now, cut it out, Rick. You know how I feel. I'd like to break Smiley with my bare hands. Only I'm a cop. So are you, even without the old badge. I'll skip the speeches. Where do I start? Smiley hangs around the Bowery quite a bit. And chances are he's hiding down there. Well, the Bowery boys don't talk much to police, but they might to you. Well, I have some friends down there. I might get a lead. Keep in touch with my office. And remember, Rick, I want Smiley alive, if possible. Sure, Walt. If possible. <laughs> I got in my car and drove toward the Bowery. I kept seeing two faces in front of me. One, a white-haired policeman ready for retirement. 
lying in a hospital fighting for his life. And the other, a weasel-faced punk with a slimy smile. You don't often get mad in my business. It doesn't pay off. But there are times when it can't be helped. In the Bowery, I began looking for Leo Watts, a little panhandler with a big heart. I'd done Leo a favor a few months back, and I knew I could count on him to return it. I finally located him in a mission, working over a bowl of hot soup. Well, hello, Leo. Uh, huh? Oh, well, Richard Diamond, what brings you down here? You broke? <laughs> well, not quite, Leo. Uh, sit down, have some soup. It's free. Well, I'd, uh, I'd rather have some help, Leo. Oh, oh, sure, Rick. Anything I can do, you know that. Uh, tell me, uh, do you know a guy named Smiley Brill? Smiley Brill, yeah, I seen him around. I don't know him so well, though. What about his friends, Leo? Know anyone he might go to if he was in trouble? I'm afraid not, Rick. I can ask around, though. Some of the boys might know. Uh, would you do that, Leo? I'd appreciate it. Sure. You sit tight, Ricky, and finish my soup. I'll be right back. Leo disappeared, and I waited in the mission. A little old lady brought me a fresh bowl of soup, gave me a lecture and left with a rewarded attitude after I promised to give up Muscatel. Finally, about 20 minutes later, Leo returned. Not much, Rick, but something to start on. Uh, Smiley had a girl he used to see a lot last year. Whether he's still seen her, I don't know. What's her name? Jewel Sanker. Uh, dances at the Gaiety down the street. <laughs> Quite a dance, too. Well, thanks, Leo. I'll have a talk with her. Uh, if she can help you, meet me back here in a few hours. Maybe I can dig up some more Smiley's path. Good, good. Only well, suppose I meet you out front instead, Leo. I just can't take another bowl of soup. At the Gaiety Theater, I found a stage doorman with a case of bad eyesight. Five dollars made it even worse, and I got by him without as much as a hey you. Jewel Sanker was on stage, and I waited in the wings. The boys wanted more, but Jewel threw them a kiss and skipped off the stage right into the arms of yours truly. I'm sorry, dear, but I've given up Muscatel. I have to have some vices. Huh? Oh, skip it. Joel, I'd like to talk to you. So would every guy in that audience out there. Of course, you don't look like most of the guys. Your clothes are pressed. Carry a handkerchief, too. I'm a real dude. Oh, you're cute. Only I've got no time to talk. I've got to change for my next number. Mind if I walk along to your dressing room? Suit yourself. Joel, I, uh, I'm looking for an old friend of yours. I've got a lot of old friends. Mm, this one's named Smiley Brill. Oh, Jim. A real nothing. What do you want with that, stoop? A little talk. You're a great one for having talks with people. Mm, I was a lonely child. Here's where I changed. Do you want to come in? Hmm, silly question. Oh, stop dreaming. I forgot a screen in here. Well, that should bring my blood pressure back down to normal. Wait till you see my next costume. It's made out of carnations. Oh, I bet you smell divine. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sit down and I'll be right out. What did you say you wanted to see? Uh, Smiley Brill. Oh, yeah. Him and me broke up. When did you see him last? About a week ago. Haven't seen him for about three months, and then he shows up. He wants me to go out with him again. Mm, did you? No, he's a bum. Him and me always used to fight about him not working. When we went out, I always had to pay the check. There. How do you like the costume? Well, well, I can see why it didn't take you long to get in it. Only aren't you afraid those flowers might wilt? Yeah, that's the idea. I see. Uh, getting back to Smiley. Oh, forget him. He's a deadbeat. Besides, I've got to get back on stage. Uh, just one more question. When you saw Smiley last week, did he say where he was living? Uh-uh. Hmm. Well, do you know of anywhere he might be? No. Wait a minute. He tried to give me some line about working. I said something about the merry-go-round. Merry-go-round? Yes. Said he had a part-time job now and... Oh, I don't remember all he said. Look, I've got to go. Time for my number. Drop around again sometime, huh? Glad you got here early, Rick. How'd you make out with Jewel? Oh, she doesn't know where Smiley is, Leo. But, uh, tell me, 
Is there any place around here called the merry-go-round? A bar, maybe? Merry-go-round? No, not around here. Why? Uh, never mind. How did you do? Well, I asked around. Smiley ain't been around the street much these days, but I did find out where Bertie Morgan lives. A couple of years back, Bertie and Smiley served time together. Guys get pretty close when they're in stir. Yeah. Well, maybe Bertie knows where Smiley would hide. Worth a chance anyway, Leo. Well, here's Bertie's address in this paper. <laughs> I hope you can make it out. <laughs> Bertie's a real nut. He keeps nothing but birds in his room. <laughs> the place looks like a pet shop. Thanks, Leo. See you later. I started up the street toward the address Leo had given me. Finding Smiley Brill was developing into a slow search. All I could do was keep questioning people who might know Smiley's whereabouts and hope for a break. I located Bertie Morgan's rooming house, but I didn't go right in. Instead, I went into a drugstore on the corner and put in a call to Walt Levinson. Homicide, Levinson. Rick, Walt, your men turn up anything on Brill yet? Not a thing. How about you? Well, uh, so far, nothing. I'm following up another lead, though, now. If it doesn't take me anywhere, I'm afraid I'll be stuck. Don't quit now, Rick. I just heard from the hospital, Ben Johnson. Didn't make it. Oh, no. Follow that lead, Rick. Get Smiley. Yeah, Walt. I'll get him. If I have to stay on his trail till doomsday, I'll get him. <laughs> Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. After all the various tests for cigarette mildness, camels lead all other cigarettes in popularity by billions of cigarettes a year. One important reason is camels' flavor, flavor that gives you rich cigarette enjoyment pack after pack, week after week. Another big reason for camels' overwhelming popularity lead is camels' mildness. Mildness proved this way. In a coast-to-coast -coast test, hundreds of men and women, people with normal throats, smoked only camels for 30 days. During that time, noted throat specialists made careful weekly examinations of the throats of those smokers. And the throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Why wait any longer to start your own 30-day camel test? Smoke camels for 30 days. See for yourself. How flavorful camels are. Prove to yourself how well camels agree with your throat, pack after pack, week after week. How mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. So Ben Johnson hadn't made it. Now I was looking for a killer. A killer named Smiley Brill. I crossed the street, went into the rooming house. Bertie Morgan had been in prison with Smiley, and Bertie lived in room number 12. I went there. Yeah. Bertie Morgan was a little man with a nose that resembled a parrot's beak. He had beady, bird-like eyes that stared straight at you and never seemed to blink. Behind him, I could see that his room was filled with caged birds, all chirping. Bertie Morgan was well named. Eh? What you want, bud? Well, I'm, uh, I'm selling a new brand of bird seed. Thought you just might be in the market. Bird seed, eh? That's right. I got plenty of bird seed. Oh, but none like this, friend. Get your foot out of the door. Now, Bertie, think of your canary. Beat it. Now, move aside, Bertie. I'm coming in. <laughs> Here. Oh, now that's better. What's the big idea of forcing your way in here? Sorry, Bertie, but I'm tired of being polite. You got no right here. Look, you're scaring my birds. Well, they'll get over it. Now, you tell me. What about Smiley Brill? Well, what about him? He's a friend of yours, isn't yeah, he? I got no friends. I just stay here and tend to my birds. Birds I like, people I don't. You seen Brill since your prison days together? Sure, but that don't make us bosom pals. See, who are you? How long ago since you've seen him? A uh, month, maybe two. You sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. How long were you in prison together? I don't have to answer your question. You want a broken nose? <laughs> Wait a minute, now look. Uh, well, I'm not uh, kidding, pal. I want answers. 
How long did you share a cell with Smiley? <clears throat> Two years. By that, I mean that when you get out, you got to pat around together. No, but it does mean you might know where Smiley is now. In two years, he must have told you a lot about the people he knew, where he hung around. Well, sure, yeah, but... Sit down, Bertie. Huh? Sit down. <laughs> now, tell me everything you remember Smiley talking about in jail. Well, look, that was a long time ago. Then I... refresh your memory. Who did he say his friends were? Think back, Bertie, then start talking. I was being hard on Bertie, but it was my last chance. He began talking about everything he could remember that he and Smiley had talked about. Girls, sports, anything. Finally, after about ten minutes, Bertie was getting tired, and he still hadn't said anything that might give me a lead. Uh, give me a break, huh? Listen to my birds, they're hungry, I gotta feed them. Now they can wait. You still haven't said anything important, Bertie. Yeah, so how should I know what you think's important? I told you what I remember him saying, that's all. What did Smiley plan on doing when he got out of jail? Uh, having a good time, that's all he wanted. Did he talk about work? What kind of a job was he going to look for? Job, Smiley? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. He didn't want to go to work. His uncle even wrote and offered him a job, but this guy's strictly a bum. Well, what about his uncle? You didn't mention him before. Yeah, I didn't think of him before. Well, you're thinking of him now. Tell me about him. Yeah, he's an old geezer. Joe Brill raised Smiley after his mom and pa kicked out. You say he offered Smiley a job. What kind of a job? Oh, handyman, I guess. The old boy runs a business over on 34th Street, a kid place. A what? Oh, you know, one of them toy land spots. He's got a corner lot there with some rides on it, electric swings and that sort of thing. I went past it once. It's a nice place. Rides for kids, huh? Merry-go-round? Huh? This place. It has a merry-go-round? Yeah, a big one. Hey, why don't you go write it and leave me alone? Uh, maybe I will, Bertie. Give me address at the place. And you can go feed your birds. It was the first break I'd had. Smiley's girlfriend had told me that he was working at a merry-go-round. Now I knew where it was. It was getting dark as I turned up 34th Street, but I spotted the lights of the Toyland. Parked went toward the merry-go-round in the center of the lot. It was the only ride still operating. There were two or three children riding the wooden animals around and around. In the center of the carousel, I spotted an old man standing beside a big lever. As I approached, the man pulled the lever toward him, and the carousel slowly stopped moving around. Okay, kids, all off. Come on now. Get off there, sonny. Run along home now. Oh, uh, Mr. Brill. That's right. Only I'm closing up now. Well, I, I don't want to ride. I just want to ask you some questions. What about? Uh, about your nephew. Huh? Yes, I'm looking for Smiley. He was working here a week ago. Well, yeah, he was, but he ain't here now. Well, where is he? You know, hasn't been around for a few days. Who are you and why are you looking for Smiley? Well, I'm a private detective, Mr. Brill. Smiley's in trouble, real trouble. Oh, uh, listen, I got to go back to the shack over there, turn out the lights. City raises cane if I stay open after six. Well, I'll walk with you. You know, uh, you don't seem surprised that your nephew's in trouble, Brill. Surprised? Mr. Anything that boy does is no surprise to me. Tried to raise him right, but he run wild. Figured if I give him a job here, he might settle down. I was wrong, I guess. Mm -hmm. Have you heard from him since this morning? Nope. Oh, this is it. Uh, mister, would you mind reaching up there and pull that light switch? It's too high for me. Oh, sure, sir. There. Now, how about... Oh! When I pulled that switch to turn the lights out, Brill decided to put my lights out, too. He must have hit me with an old piece of pipe, but whatever it was, it caused the blood to rush past my eyes and a million rockets to go off in my head. I don't know how long I was out, but when I came to, I was inside the shack, and I wasn't alone. In the corner stood the old man, but standing over me was the man I'd spent all day to find, Smiley Brill. Come on, Diamond, come on, you ain't dead yet. Mm. Well, well, Smiley Brill, brave man with a gun. Yeah, brave enough to take care of you, Shamus. Smiley, cut out your yapping and get out of here while you can. Shut up, they got a dragnet out for me. I might be picked up alone, but Diamond here gets along real swell with the bulls. He's going to help me get through. Oh, you're crazy, Smiley. You'll never get through. I may get along with the police, but so did Ben Johnson. You try and make a break and the first cop will shoot you on sight. 
You're a dead man, Smiley. You know that smart talk coming from a guy on the wrong side of this gun? Now get up on your feet. Where's your car, Smiley? Out and back. You still got Diamond's gun? Yeah. Well, keep it on him. I'll check around outside to make sure it's all clear. And don't take any chances. If Diamond so much as blinks an eyelash, pull the trigger. Well, Mr. Brill, you must feel pretty proud of your nephew. Keep quiet. Smiley's a good boy. Just a little while, that's all. Oh, sure, sure. Tell me, Brill, what's going to happen to you? Smiley makes a break for it and leaves you behind. And for helping him escape, you'll be hauled in as an accessory to murder. Murder? What are you talking about? Well, why do you think your nephew's running? Smiley got too much to drink. He stole a car. So that's the line he gave you, huh? Oh, sure. Now, look, mister. I'm the only family Smiley's got. When his pa died, I promised to look after him. Now he's in trouble. I gotta help him get away. So you just stay right there. And this trouble he's in, you think it's car stealing? Well, it's murder, Brill. Smiley killed a cop. You lie. Smiley's wild, but he wouldn't do that. Oh, wouldn't he? Why did the police have a dragnet out? To catch a car thief? Oh, no. Murder, Brill. You think it's your duty to protect him. I wouldn't protect a killer, but Smiley's no killer. Now, you're, you're telling lies, that's all. Well, he'll be coming back soon. You'll help him get away. You'll help a killer get away. Well, I'll ask him. If, if you're telling the truth, well, uh, wait till he gets back. I still think you lie. I'm not lying, Brill. And we're not waiting till Smiley comes back. Stay back. Oh, why? Smiley didn't tell you he killed a cop. That was because he knew you wouldn't help a killer. And if you wouldn't help a killer, you would hardly turn killer yourself. No, you won't shoot me, Mr. Brill. Now, I'll take my gun. Uh, no, no. Give no, it to me. No, no. <clears throat> there. Uh, okay, Mr. Okay. Maybe I couldn't kill you, but... Smiley's no killer either. You lied about that murder. You're, you're after him for stealing the car, and he's got to have a chance. He's just a wild boy. Come back here. Hey, Smiley, look out. He's got a gun. I shoved the old man away and stepped outside. Smiley had been coming back across the grounds, and the old man's warning made him stop. Then he saw me. It was dark, and we both missed. Then Smiley dove for cover and began firing again. I crouched behind the motor box of the electric swing. Smiley! So you, Smiley! Come on out! Come and get me, Samus! I can see as well in the dark as you can! Smiley was in a good spot, and he knew it. It was dark, but he was familiar with the grounds. He could edge from one cover to another. There were no more shots for a while. I knew he'd change positions, but I'd have a hard time finding him in the dark. And then I remembered the light switch beside the shack. I edged toward it. I reached the shack and stood up. I pointed my gun out toward the lot and sent my left hand up to the switch. Then I pushed. The lights went on and I spotted Smiley standing in the center of the merry-go-round. He looked stunned at the flood of light. Drop it, Smiley! Why, you... I got him. He staggered, then fell against the big control lever in the center of the machine. The machine started going around, and the painted animals moved up and down as they circled Smiley's still body. I stood there and watched. Funny, but I didn't even feel sorry for Smiley. After all, how many cop killers have music at their funerals? Yes, Helen, dear? I forgive you for being late. Well, now that makes my little heart go pitter-patter all over the place. Only there's something I want to ask you. Mm hmm That dancer, you see. Jewel. Was she pretty? Well, I, uh... Oh, I suppose uh, you could say she was. Especially in that costume made out of carnations. Uh, I hope you were on your good behavior. Well, I, uh... I didn't pick any flowers, if that's what you mean. Rick, I hate to sound nagging, but, well, I worry about you. In every case, you seem to run into a blonde or a redhead or a brunette, and they all seem to be pretty. Now, isn't that just like a woman? Here I get slugged on the head, shot at, and meet a girl. All you worry about is the girl. Oh, you poor dear. Hmm. 
There. Oh. Does your head feel better? Oh, yes, yes. Honey, keep rubbing it. I might even feel well enough to sing a song. Hmm. I knew this conversation would get around to that sooner or later. Helen, you are so suspicious and so right. I get a warm feeling when you're by my side. The kind of warm feeling that my kiss can't hide. Hold me tight and hold me strong. It's so right. It just can't be wrong. Just as long as you're with me, I'll always find my way. Your love is like a candle that turns the night to day. My heart is yours, and come what may. That warm feeling is here to stay. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, dear. Rick. Mm-hmm. Would I look nice in a costume made out of carnations? Oh, honey, 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 you'd look wonderful in a costume made out of poison ivy. <laughs> Come here. Now, Rick. Rick, stop. Rick, stop. Rick, you stopped. Aren't we full of surprises tonight? Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? That question was asked of doctors from coast to coast in every branch of medicine. The brand named most was Camel. Why don't you smoke Camels, too? You'll enjoy rich, full flavor and true cigarette mildness. The kind of mildness that lets you really enjoy Camels pack after pack, carton after carton. Make your next pack Camels. How mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels have now sent more than 198 million gift cigarettes to hospitalized veterans and members of our armed forces. This week's packs of gift camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Brooklyn, New York, and Biloxi, Mississippi. Hamilton Air Force Hospital, San Rafael, California. To all hospitals operated by the Caribbean Command of the U.S. Army. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Dick Carr with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, and Paul Richards. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. Men, when you smoke a pipe, it's for pleasure, isn't it? Then use the tobacco that leaves the pleasure in and the bite out. I'm talking about Prince Albert, the National Joy Smoke. Listen. The bite is out and the pleasure's in when you smoke Prince Albert. It's specially treated not to bite your tongue. The bite is out and the pleasure's in. Listen next week for another exciting adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on the American Broadcasting Company. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com.
adventure fans, calling all Dick Tracy fans. Stand by. Dick Tracy is on the air. The makers of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the two tempting, delicious, nourishing cereals that are shot from guns, now bring you another thrilling Dick Tracy detective adventure. Big guns, hear them? For the next time you have a big dish of crisp, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice for breakfast, remember the sound of the big guns, because those two delicious cereals are actually shot from guns. Sun-ripened grains of nourishing wheat and rice are loaded into the guns, and then these little kernels of grain are exploded to eight times their normal size. That makes them look different and taste better than ordinary cereals. That special Quaker process makes puffed wheat and puffed rice specially easy to digest so that you get trigger-fast food energy more quickly and easily. And you need lots of quick food energy if you want to be as fast on your feet as your friend Dick Tracy is. And here's a good idea. Puffed wheat and puffed rice are two different delicious flavors. So ask Mother to get a package of each at the grocer's. And then you and Mother and Dad can have Quaker puffed wheat for breakfast one morning and Quaker puffed rice the next. That really gives you variety, doesn't it? So look in the pantry today to see if one of those famous red and blue packages is there now. If it's Quaker puffed wheat, ask Mother to get a package of Quaker puffed rice. And if it's Quaker puffed rice, ask her to get some Quaker puffed wheat. And then you have both for a delightful change that thousands of wide-awake boys, girls, and grown-ups enjoy every day. And remember, fellows and girls, there's another secret code message at the end of the program today. So be sure you have your pencil, paper, and code book ready. Dick Tracy has been trying to protect Dryden Small, a well-known Egyptologist from dark forces which seek his death. Small has received strange warnings, and several times his life has been attempted unsuccessfully due to the daring efforts of Dick Tracy. Both Dick and Pat are convinced that Small has kept from them the real reason for these mysterious attacks. In our last episode, we heard how a strange message, seemingly written by an invisible hand, had appeared on the wall above Small's bed. Let's see what the invisible hand is writing. Your hour is at hand. Your end is near. The black pearl of Osiris must shine again. Yes, yes, and look there on the floor. It's another scarab, Tracy, another scarab. Yes, so I see. Another symbol of death and destruction. Why don't you do something? But it's no use. You can't fight the supernatural. They told me there was a curse upon the tomb of Tutankhamun. I should never have gone into it. All the others who have been in it have come to sudden death. Oh, stop it. Stop it, Small. There's nothing supernatural here. I know, but Dick, the writing on the wall, we saw the message being written. Yes, sir. And now look, it's beginning to fade. Ghost writing, that's what it is. The handwriting of a ghost. Oh, come, come, Small. Pull yourself together. This isn't the work of a ghost. The man with the yellow face, whoever he may be, paid a visit to this cabin in our absence. How do you know he was here? Why, it's simple enough. The scarab on the floor, he left it there. The handwriting on the wall, he put it there. No, no, no. He might have put the scarab there, but the handwriting, that couldn't have been done by anybody human. We saw the message being written and there was no one here. Of course there wasn't. The message was written before we got here. We saw it when we turned on the bed lamp. I don't get it, Dick. Pat, put your hand over that lamp, about six inches away. All right. I've got it there now. What do you feel? Nothing but heat. Ah, precisely. Heat. The heat from the lamp. Do you recall ever having used heat in connection with invisible messages before, Pat? Oh, why, sure. Say, I get it. This message was written in invisible ink and couldn't be seen until the heat of the lamp brought it out on the wall. Go to the head of the class, Pat. That's exactly what happened here. The man with a yellow face wrote his message in invisible ink. Small came in, turned on the lamp, and in half an hour or so, the heat from the lamp brought the message out. There's your supernatural for you, Mr. Small. You you make it sound simple. It is simple. The rest of this case were as simple as that handwriting. We'd have no problem. But but it's not simple, Small, because you choose to make it difficult. I choose to make it difficult? Yes. You refuse to tell us all you know about this. You refuse to tell us what we've got to know of where to protect you against the man with the yellow face. There's a definite reason why you're being followed... There's a definite reason for these attempts on your life, such as the one in the dining salon tonight. There's some reason for these scarabs and that message on the wall. Now, what is it? 
I'm sorry, but I don't know any more than I've told you. And I've told you once, and I'll tell you again, that you're not being entirely truthful. Now, look here. I want you to tell me the meaning of that message about the Black Pearl of Osiris. Yeah, that was a queer one. What is the Black Pearl of Osiris anyway, Dick? I don't know about the Black Pearl, Pat. I do know, however, that Osiris was a god worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. And that even today, there are certain secret societies which still worship him. Hmm. Your knowledge of Egyptian history is remarkable, Tracy. Well, unfortunately, I don't know quite enough. But you know what I want to know, Small. What is the Black Pearl of Osiris? I demand an answer. I, I don't know, Tracy. I swear it. If I knew, don't you think I'd tell you? I, I, I feel rather faint. I, I wonder if one of you would mind going up on deck with me. Just for a little while. Well, uh, I, I had a date with a... All right, Pat, you'll have to forget your date. I've got to see the captain at once. You'll have to stay with Small. Keep close to him on deck and don't let him out of your sight. Okay. I hope I get a chance to explain to that girl that I didn't mean to disappoint her. You feel better now, Small? Yes. Yes, Mr. Patton, the air is doing me good. Looks like we're going to have a fog. You can see whispers of it floating past the binnacle light up there. Yes. You know, Small, you really ought to come clean with Tracy. Patton. Yeah? That, that man leaning against the rail. Uh, he, he just looked this way. And his face. Well, what about his face? I, I'm not sure, but it, it looked yellow. It, it, it... Now, take it easy. Don't start getting jittery. Don't be, begin seeing a yellow face in every passenger on this ship. Look, look. He, he's moving away from the rail. He's disappearing into the fog. What was that? Something dropped at our feet. Yeah, I heard it. Let me see. Hey, hey here it is. What? Why, see, it looks it looks like a scarab. A scarab? A pattern. It, it's another warning. That was the man with the yellow face. Yeah, yeah, we'd better get down and get to your cabin. I'll get in touch with Tracy. No, 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 no. Not back to the cabin. I'm afraid to go there. Let's stay in the open. Okay, okay, but I better get Tracy here as quick as I can. Come on over by the light. What are you going to do? Well, Dick's in the captain's cabin. I'm going to send him a message. A message in code. Well, come in, Mr. Tracy. Glad to see you. How are you, Captain? Worried, Tracy. Very much worried. I'm glad you're here. I don't like the things that have been happening on this ship of mine. Well, I'm sorry about the need for searching the ship, but you must understand, Captain, that at any moment, one of your passengers may be, well, put out of the way. Mm, that isn't what I refer to, Tracy. There are other things that are wrong. Such as? Well, have you heard about what's been going on down in the hold? The hold? Mm-hmm. I know. What's happened down there? One of the crew, a fellow named Weeks, was found about an hour ago, totally unconscious. Unconscious? Yes, lying in the door of the storage room. He's not a strong fellow. As a matter of fact, he has a weak heart. That's why we have him down there. All he does is check the books and little odd jobs like that, you know. Yes, yes, but what made him unconscious? Well, according to his story, Tracy, as he was approaching the storage room, he noticed the door was open, which was unusual. As he began to investigate, he suddenly saw, standing in the doorway itself, a strange-looking figure. The next thing he remembers, he was lying on a cot. The ship's doctor was working over him. Huh. He's not given to seeing things, is he? No, I don't think so. He's a stable, dependable fellow. At any rate, he's never seen things before. Well, in that case, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to investigate that storage room. Now, about the search for the man with the yellow face, Captain. Yes, I wanted to talk to you about that, Tracy. We, we don't seem to be making much progress. Matter of fact, Tracy, we're not making any progress at all. Yes, yes, I was afraid of that. Oh, excuse me. Come in. There's a message for Mr. Tracy, sir. Oh, give it here. Where did you get this? It was given to me by a gentleman down on deck, eh, sir? Thank you. Excuse me, Captain. Yes, certainly. It's a code message from Pat. Hmm? Prisoner 20, 21, 12, 16, 7, 10, 18, 22. Uh, will you excuse me, Captain? I've got to join Mr. Patton on deck immediately. Uh, nothing wrong, is there, Tracy? I don't know. That's what I want to find out. And I've got to find out fast. Well, I'll go along with you, Tracy. I've got to go up to the bridge, and this will be on my way. Glad to have your company, Captain, but let's hurry. Uh, we can take this companionway here, Tracy. It leads down to deck A. Fine. Uh, here we are, deck A. Uh, 
I don't see Mr. Patton. Do you? No, but this fog is getting thicker. Mm-hmm. He may be down at the other end. Come on. Well, I'll leave you here, Tracy. Man I... overboard! Man overboard! Yes. Man overboard, Tracy. Get down there as fast as you can. I'll see the ordering the boats over the side. Right. Man overboard! Man overboard! Hey, hey, you there. Where is he? Oh, he's there. He's there. Man overboard! Dryden Small, what's happened here? Uh, the man with the yellow face. Patton. Oh, yes, 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 what happened? Overboard. Patton, uh, Patton was thrown overboard. What? Pat overboard? Wait, Tracy, what are you doing? Why are you taking off your coat? Why do you think? I'm going after Pat. Stop, don't. Another man overboard. Another man overboard. Oh, Tracy, they'll both be found. Patton and Tracy, too. Will Dick save Pat? Or has the detective's friend been swallowed up by the black waters in the night? Dick will save him if anyone can. But now the makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, those two popular, delicious, quick energy-giving cereals that are shot from guns, invite you to attend another meeting of the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. Here comes Dick Tracy Jr. now. The 20th meeting will now come to order, patrol members. And let's be sure we all have pencils and paper ready to take down today's secret code message. Are you going to give Dick Tracy's friends the message that Pat sent Dick today, or have you a special secret patrol message, Junior? Oh, both, Mr. Quaker Man. First, I'm going to repeat the message that Pat sent to Dick Tracy. Good. Are you ready, patrol members? Here it is. Prisoner 20, 21, 12, 16. 7, 10, 18, 20... Two. Once more, Junior, to make sure everyone got it. All right, Mr. Quaker Man. It's prisoner 20, 21, 12, 16, 7, 10, 18, 20, 2. Fine. And now what's the special patrol message, Junior? Here it is. Are you all ready? It's Buffalo. 21, 12, 14, 10, 12, 4. 10, 20, 13, 3, 6, 10, 20, 13, 3, 21. 1, 8, 14, 5. Better repeat that one too, Junior, I think. Okay. Ready, everyone? It's Buffalo... 21, 12, 14, 10, 12, 4. 10, 20, 13, 3. 6, 10, 20, 13, 3, 21. 1, 8, 14, 5. Well, that sounds very important, Junior. It is. It's a special order for patrol members. But how about the fellows and girls who aren't members and can't decode the messages? Well, we can't very well give away the patrol secret. Of course not. I can't imagine any real wide-awake boy or girl not joining, can you? Not unless they don't know how to join on the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. So maybe you better tell them, just in case there are some fellows and girls listening in for the first time. Good idea. Well, here's how you can join the patrol and get the secret code, the patrol pledge, and the membership badge so you don't miss any of the fun. Just tear the tops off two packages of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice or one of each. Put them in an envelope with your... You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r. Brought to you by g3pl.com. Now, from the makers of Cold Water Elmo, a black Rolls Royce stood outside an imposing-looking building near Whitehall in London. Inside the building was a long corridor with rows of offices on either side. Each door had the title of the area of England printed upon it. Southwest Division, Southeast Division, Midlands, etc. At the end of the corridor was an office marked Coordination and Control. Two tough-looking guards stood on either side of the door, They gazed impassively ahead. Further down the corridor, there was a young woman in charlady's clothes. She was on her hands and knees, scrubbing away at the floor. She looked up and murmured, It won't be long now.
the Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, the Avengers. An Omo user, always an Omo user. This is what Mrs. Lyons of Yellowwood Park, Durban, has to say. It is the one party that does everything. Well, for me, I know that. Yes. There's so many things that I've, I've used and experimented with just to prove cold water Omo, really to put it to the ultimate test. You know, and I find that it's, it's come up to all my expectations. Yes. Cold water Omo cleans best. International fashion models like Jan Bishop care for their complexion with Lux Beauty Soap. I know of no other beauty soap that could care for my complexion as well as Lux. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. In which Mother, as usual, hands a case over to John Seed, who thinks it's very serious, and Emma Peel thinks it's a case of... Love all. The office of the Missile Redeployment Ministry was luxuriously furnished. Thick curtains covered the windows. Around an oval table, several distinguished-looking men were seated. On his feet at the head of the table, Sir Rodney Kellogg, a dapper, white-haired man, was addressing the meeting. He had about him an air of quiet respectability, and he was obviously in a position of higher authority than the others. In front of him lay a book bearing the notice, Read, Digest, and Pass On. And finally, may I impress upon you that this is a matter of utmost secrecy. The Royal Commission's report must on no account be discussed outside these walls. Each of you will read it in turn and pass it on to the man whose name is next on the list. When you're all thoroughly acquainted with its contents, we will meet again to put its recommendations into effect. Uh, that's all, gentlemen. Uh, good evening to you all. <laughs> The men left, and Sir Rodney moved over to the guards at the door. Uh, thank you. You needn't wait any longer. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The guards walked smartly down the corridor and through the double doors. Immediately, the char lady picked up her bucket and walked down the corridor. She walked boldly through the door and closed it behind her. The moment Sir Rodney heard the sound of the bucket, he swung round, his face suffused with delight and anticipation. Martha, darling. Oh, Dad, oh, my sweet dog. Oh, I, I'm so sorry the meeting took so long. Oh, it doesn't matter, darling, so long as you're here. Oh, you are lovely. What did you talk about at the meeting? Uh, oh, uh, routine stuff, mostly. Uh, all very dull, I'm afraid. Oh, tell me about it, please. No, no not now. We've, uh, <laughs> we've more important things. No. To I want to hear about the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but my little secrets are so boring to you, my love. It wouldn't possibly interest a lovely girl like you. Oh, but you're quite wrong, Roger, darling. I'm interested in everything you do. Everything about you. Especially your secrets. <laughs> oh, you are going to tell me everything, aren't you, darling? John Steed thought the morning rather cold, but quite bracing. He walked rather jauntily down the street, swinging his umbrella and raising his bowler to the odd acquaintance. At a sign reading, Danger, Men at Work, Steed raised an eyebrow, turned off into the cordoned area, and reached Mother's headquarters. Hello, Mother. That sign outside's a bit misleading, isn't it? 
mother in his wheelchair was playing table tennis with Mrs. Peel. I had to get some form of exercise. Ah. My game, I think, Mrs. Peel. Uh, what's the problem? Well, that's what I'm waiting to hear. You know what a sticky wicket is, don't you? A difficult one. Now that's what we're batting on at the moment. Why? There's a security leak at the ministry. Hmm? Which department? Yes, I'll read appointments. That's impossible. All the personnel have a top QR security rating. I know, I know, I know. But the evidence is overwhelming. A glass of white wine, Steve, Mr. Beale. Oh, no, thanks, Mother. But early for me. Never too early for white wine. Red, yes. White, never. As I say, there is a leak, all right. The other side seems to know each move we make almost before we make it. Any suspects? Yes. Who? Every man in the department had more under surveillance for two months. Mm. Ah, that's better. Not worth playing Mrs. Peel. Have you checked all their contacts? With a microscope. Oh, perfectly legitimate. No leaves there. Who's in charge over there? Sir Rodney Kellogg. You want me to go over there? No, let's keep go. We'll have another game. And uh, do try to give me a little competition this time, Mrs. Peel. <laughs> Sir Rodney Kellogg was sitting at his desk. Martha, the char lady, was sitting on his lap. So, uh, that's the situation, my angel. Mm. The report proposed a streamlining of the divisional areas and an overhaul of the entire national security system. Oh, I see. Uh, why you should bother your pretty little head with such tedious stuff is beyond me. Oh, but Rodney Downing, I find it fascinating. And uh, there's one thing, though, that's not quite clear. Mm -hmm. What's that, my love? Mm, well, what happens to the Pearl Beach base after the reorganization? Oh, it'll be used as a decoy. Uh, the new center of the East Anglian complex will be... That's enough, Sir Rodney. The curtains parted and Metcalf, a tough-looking young man, entered suddenly. Who, who the devil are you? Metcalf, security. I thought something like this was going on. I must ask you both to accompany me to headquarters. Oh, Rodney, darling, it's all my fault. I'm so sorry. No, oh, no, my dearest, it, uh... It was I who was foolish. You mustn't blame yourself. Oh, but I do. I got you into this mess, and it's my responsibility to get you out. Oh, Rogers, hold me just once more. Martha placed herself close to Sir Rodney, looking up beseechingly into his eyes, and slipped a pearl-handled revolver from under her overalls. She pointed it at Metcalf. It has to be done, my darling. It has to be done. <laughs> When John Steve arrived at the ministry and walked up the steps towards Sir Rodney's office, he heard three shots from down the corridor. He broke into a run and burst into Sir Rodney's office at speed. Sir Rodney was standing, gun in hand, staring down at Metcalf's dead body. Give me that gun, Sir Rodney. <clears throat> Seems to even shoot in triplicate. What's it all about? I, I found him in here, going through my papers. Uh, there was a struggle. Uh... And you shot him? Yes. Without giving him a chance to explain. Well, I, I, I've been drinking. I, I wasn't thinking very clearly. I take it you have a permit for this gun? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, Where did you get it? Uh, it belonged to my father. A small pistol with a pearl handle. Well, maybe my mother. I, I can't remember. Steed looked at Sir Rodney and without a word broke open the gun, removing the remaining bullets. <sighs> Here, loaded. Hmm. I said loaded. Go on. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, it must be jammed. Why are you looking at me like that? Are you are implying that I don't know how to load my own gun? I'm implying that you're covering up for someone. Somebody who gave you this gun and told you to confess to a murder you didn't commit. Oh, that's absurd. Why should I want to ruin a, ruin a successful career? I, I, I... Uh... Sir Rodney stopped in mid-sentence. His eyes settled on the charwoman's bucket standing in the corner... A silly smile touched his lips, and his expression became a hideous word, but nonetheless the correct one, gooey. Something the matter, Sir Rodney? Uh, uh, what? Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm not myself today. Uh, what was I saying? Never mind. I'm putting you under house arrest pending a full investigation. You'll be confined to this office till further notice. Oh, one last question, Sir Rodney. 
Are you aware that there's a security leak from this department? And what did he reply to that question? Deep? Nothing. He looked at me as I was talking Mongolian. And were you? No, but I do quite well, actually. Shut, Mrs. Peel. So you don't think he knew who Metcalf was? I don't think he knew who anyone was. He was too busy thinking of something else. Any idea what? No. He seemed to spend the entire interview in a kind of trance. He kept staring into space with an idiotic smile on his face. Uh, could be drink, of course. Some people do overindulge. Could be drugs. Could be love. Mm, it sounds as though he's being got at. Intimidation? Blackmail? Infatuation? I must ask you to curb your natural frivolity, Mrs. Peel. This case could have serious consequences. The idea of a respectable man like Sir Rodney losing his head at woman is too ludicrous for words. But love is ludicrous, Mother. When a man's in love with a woman, she can make him do anything. Don't you agree, Stephen? Uh, may I take that up with you later, Mrs. Field? Meanwhile, anyone for table tennis? a new way to fight tooth decay for Keeps. New fluoride for Keeps toothpaste. It's the clear blue way to fight tooth decay, and it's the best anti-decay toothpaste around. New great tasting for Keeps toothpaste. The clear blue way to fight tooth decay for Once an OMO user, always an OMO user. So many housewives, like Mrs. Adnall, say. I wash every single thing in cold water anode. Anything that's washable come out spotlessly clean. Yes, OMO cleans best. The Avengers. every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I no longer see fearful things in the night. All that has changed. Night and the shadows are friendly. Now it is the daylight that frightens me. Another Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the unusual story of Legacy of Death. 
It was ten years ago that Henry Mitchell, formerly a biologist, married Martha Holliston, the widow of a wealthy cotton grower. Martha continued to direct the business of the plantation with the aid of Henry as overseer. She had one child, a daughter, by her deceased husband, a girl named Doreen. Now the mother lies on her deathbed. She's been ill for almost a year and grown steadily weaker. It won't be long now, Henry. And there's something I must tell you. Something you must promise to do for me. Yes, Martha, I'll do anything. It's about my daughter. Doreen is 21 now. She's a woman, and she'll be thinking of marriage soon. I know, Martha. I've watched her every move, raised her carefully. I've been stern in my opinions regarding her. And perhaps at times I've, I've seemed too strict. Yes, Martha, but a mother knows best. Doreen has always been an odd child. You've mentioned that yourself many times. And as she grew older, she became more strange each day. A peculiar, exotic mind. She must still be guarded and handled carefully until she reaches 30. What are you trying to say, Martha? Doreen is the last of her father's line. And from that line, she's inherited something horrible. What? You mean insanity? No, not insanity. Not insanity? Well... But a horrible tendency. It skipped her father. If it appears at all, it always occurs in the early 20s. If it doesn't appear by the time they reach 30... Then they're safe. What is it, Martha? What has she inherited? The tendency to murder. Murder? Good Lord. She must be handled delicately. Gently, like a flower. Treated as a minor until she's 30. And if she suffers no emotional upset by then, she's safe. Love, deep love, paves the way for possible emotional upsets. Jealousy, hatred, and fear. But, But it may skip her. You must promise me that you'll care for her as you would your own daughter. Yes, dear, I promise. (sighs) According to her father's request, I've left the estate to Doreen with you as trustee and manager at a yearly salary. Yes, yes, Martha, that's very good of you. Until she's 30, she must have your consent in every matter, particularly marriage. Yes. (sighs) If she defies you regarding marriage, then you must tell her the truth, but only then. I understand, Martha. Oh, please, please don't say any more. Now that I've told you, I I can rest so much easier. I, I'll send Doreen in now, dear. I'll be just outside. Henry, you're a darling. Doreen stepped into the room, knelt at her mother's bedside, and a few minutes later, Martha was gone. Now six months have passed, and Henry has hired another overseer, young Irving Wallace, a graduate of Agricultural University. Irving has fallen madly in love with the strange, unpredictable Doreen. Do you realize, Doreen, I I almost turned down the offer to take this job. And something kept saying to me, take it, take it. And I did, darling. I don't know why at the time, but now I know. The night. I love the night and the river and the moon. What? Daytime and the sun unnerve me. Never at ease, never able to think clearly. Till the sun goes down and I see the moon on the river. It is pretty. When I was a little girl, I was always frightened of the dark. I fancied all sorts of horrors waiting for me in every shadow. Yes. Now, in the last year or two, I've somehow lost my fear of the darkness. I no longer see things in the night. Night and the shadows are friendly. And it's the daylight that frightens me. Doreen, what are you trying to say? What? What sort of talk is this? What's happened to you, Doreen? You've changed. You've grown distant and detached. We come down here to the river now, and you just stare at the moon and talk in riddles. I don't understand it. No? I don't either. Well, I don't like it, darling. It, well, it's not natural. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean I don't approve of such ideas coming from the woman I uh, love. You don't? I want my wife to be normal. I don't want her to be afraid of the daylight and come to her senses only at night. What right have you to say what I shall like? What do you mean by your wife? What? Doreen, what? 
I thought... Did I ever say I'd marry you? No, but what else would I think? Did I ever say I loved you? You surely gave no indication that you didn't. What's wrong with you, Doreen? Doreen! What? Oh, please, darling, tell me what's wrong. What have I done? Nothing. Done nothing. Do you mean you... You don't want to marry me? I don't know. I... I'm afraid. Oh, darling, if you only knew how I worship you... I'm just afraid. Afraid of all men. What an awful thought. Please go. Please, leave me alone. I can't understand you, Doreen. Please go, Irving. All right. I'll go if you insist. But please don't stay here long. It's, it's almost midnight. What? Nothing, darling. Nothing. <laughs> I saw the light in the library, Mr. Mitchell, and I wanted to talk to you. Have you noticed anything strange about your stepdaughter lately? Strange. I mean about her behavior, her actions. Not particularly. I, I just left her down on the riverbank, and she's talking a lot of nonsense. Nonsense? And what were you doing down at the riverbank at this time of night? I may as well tell you. I'm in love with Doreen. I want to marry her. Marry? Yes. I knew nothing of this? Well, I, I suppose it's only natural... It's just the way it happens, but... Well, really, Mr. Mitchell, I... I love her so much that I... Never mind. You needn't say any more. Good heavens. Is it such a shock? After all, she's a woman. What's wrong, Mr. Mitchell? Are you ill? No. No, I'm just... What did you say about Doreen acting strangely? Well, in, in the last few days, she's changed. She's acting in a weird sort of manner. Weird? Yes. She says that the daylight frightens her, and she, she loves the dark and the moon. Tell me, is Doreen in love with you? Well, I certainly thought she was. She led me to believe so. Until tonight. And had you talked of marriage? Not until this evening. But I thought the idea was mutual. Then all of a sudden, she turned cold. Well, that's why I came to you. Maybe she's ill or something. Yes. Yes, Irving, she is ill. What? Sit down, my boy. You really love her? Oh, more than I can tell. You have only her best interest at heart? I do. Thank heaven you told me this in time. I'm going to ask a sacrifice of you, Irving. You must stay away from Doreen. You must say no more to her about love or marriage. Why not? I love her. Then you'll do as I say. Keep out of her way as much as possible. I know that seems hard, but for her own good, you must. What do you mean? What's wrong? I see, I have to tell you the truth. Since this has happened, I must tell you. Doreen has inherited something... Something that may lie dormant, but which under emotional stress may appear without warning. Are you trying to frighten me? Oh, no. Doreen has inherited a tendency to... To what? To murder. Murder? Oh, I can't believe it. Yes. It's a strain on her father's family. It appears only in the 20s, but if it doesn't appear before 30, the person is safe from the malady. Oh, it just doesn't seem possible. I promised her dear mother I'd do my best to protect her from emotional disturbance of any kind until she reached 30. Now, do you understand? Yes, I... I understand you, but... Well, I... I'm not cold. You say she's acting strangely. That may be an indication. And you must do your part to help by staying away from her. Very well. I will. If it's for her own good. It is, Irving. Believe me. <laughs> Irving keeps his word, and difficult as it is, he avoids Doreen. Then a few weeks later, Henry Mitchell's handsome young brother, his only living relative, Clyde Mitchell, a wealthy Hollywood writer whom Henry hasn't seen in years, drops in unexpectedly. Well, Clyde, you've been doing very well in Hollywood, haven't you? Yes, indeed. Hollywood's been good to me. I've made a fortune. And I've handled my money in a better fashion than most of them. Hmm. Every dollar I get is turned over to a manager, and he invests it for me. I couldn't write my name to a check for 500 if I wanted Good. to. Good. I'm glad to hear you finally got some sense. Why did you give up your biological research? Oh, I haven't entirely given it up. I still dabble in agricultural biology. You seem to be doing all right, Henry. This is a nice plantation, nice home. I'm sorry I didn't get to meet your wife. She had a daughter, didn't she? Yes, she's here. Doreen. Strange girl, most unusual. No children of your own, Henry? None. You and I are the last of our line. We're the only living ones of the family. It's up to you to carry on the name, Clyde. Yeah. Well, I suppose I'll get around to that sooner or later. I'm engaged. I expect to be married this summer. Maybe before. Hollywood girl? She lives in Hollywood, but she came from Boston. One of the Harrington girls. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I didn't know anyone was here. Oh, come in, Doreen. Come in. This is my brother, Clyde. Clyde? I'm glad to know you, Clyde. Doreen. What a charming name. Clyde is a movie writer. Been quite successful in Hollywood. Oh, now, don't tie me down to pictures, Henry. I've written a few novels, too. Yes, I know. You wrote Moon in the River. Guilty? I was terribly impressed by it. It was... Well, it was out of this world. <laughs> I have a fan. <laughs> Are you staying for a while? Oh, a few days. I like it here. Do you? Mm. I'm glad. I... Well, I'll leave you alone now. I, I know you want to talk. Good night. Nice girl. I said she's a nice girl. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, she's gorgeous. I've never seen such red hair, such strange eyes. Why, well, they're almost... They're hypnotic. Red hair and green eyes. What did you say? I didn't say anything, Clive. Why have you brought me down here tonight, Doreen? The river, Clive. The moon in the river. Look at it. A stream of silver and gold flowing on and on. Down to the sea, to the melting pot, to eternity. Yes, it's very beautiful. That your river, moon and the river. You may be conscious of that, Clyde. It breathes and lives. That's why I've come to love the night and hold no fear of the dark. You mean you're at ease in the dark? The night I'm through and the moon thrills me. The moon and the river. And they mean the same to you. The same. They must. Or you could never have written as you did. You and I are the same, Clyde. We see alike. Look at me, Clyde. Yes? Why don't you say it? I know what you're thinking. Say it. Doreen, I... You love me. No, no, don't turn away. Look in my eyes and say it. I love you. I love you, Doreen. And I love you, darling. Oh, Clyde. If you only knew what it meant to me, you're coming here two weeks ago. You saved me, Clyde. Save me. But you don't understand, Doreen. It's, it's all wrong. Everything is wrong. Look at me, Clyde. Look. Everything is right. Just as it was intended. Isn't it? But you must listen. Hold me close, Clyde. Kiss me. Doreen, darling, I... Yes, dearest. What are you trying to tell I don't know. I can't remember. Oh, I can't Clyde. think. Nothing else matters. Nothing is real but our love. And the moon and the river. And you won't leave me, Clyde, ever. I won't let you. Doreen, please. This can't go on. It, it isn't right. I've got to get away. You won't leave. You can't leave me because you love me. Yes. Yes, help me. Help me. I, I must be mad. But I do. I do love you. But I, I just can't seem to... Don't say a word, dear. Just us. And the moon. And the river. Oh, Clyde. Uh, yes, Henry? Come into the library. I've just been talking with Irving. Said you were walking down by the riverbank a while ago. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, that is, What's I... What's wrong with you, Clyde? What's happened? I don't know, Henry. I'm leaving in the morning. Leaving? I must. I, I've got to get back to Hollywood. I'm getting married, you know. Next summer, you said. Oh, did I? Well, I, I've decided to get married as soon as possible. Clyde, I know where you've been. You've been with Doreen. Irving told me. Yes. I was with Doreen. I don't know what's happened to me since I've been here. But I do know I mustn't stay another day. I'm leaving in the morning. Have you fallen in love with Doreen? I don't know, Henry. I don't know what's wrong. Is she in love with you? Is that it? Yes, she is. I tried to fight it off, but... Well, it's just I lost all sense of logic. Doreen is a strange creature, Clyde. I'm certainly aware of that. It seems to... Uh, I'm powerless to keep away from her. I mustn't stay longer. I, uh, I'm leaving the first thing in the morning. I'm sorry to see you go, Clyde. I had hoped you'd stay longer, but perhaps under the circumstances it's best. I only wish I were free to go with you. You can come along if you want. No, I... I can't leave, Clyde. Because of Doreen. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, Clyde. I can't leave her alone for a single moment. What's wrong with her? 
There's something odd about her, and you know what it is. Does she know you're leaving? No. No, I tried to tell her. I see. And I'd better tell her? Yes. Good night, Henry. Clyde climbs the stairs and goes to his room. Henry stands in the door of the library, lost in thought. A few moments pass, and Doreen comes into the hallway from outside and starts for the stairs. Doreen? Yes? Come in. What is it? I've just learned that you've become infatuated with my brother. Infatuated? And before it becomes more serious, I, I want to warn you that it'll be a mistake for, well, for you to fall in love. What do you mean? Why shouldn't I fall in love? Well, don't you think it'd be better to learn more about a man before you allow your emotions to carry you off your feet? I don't understand you. Why should I wait? It, it'll be better if you do. Please believe me. What's the reason back of all this? Well, I... Doreen, I hate to tell you this, but... Why don't you say it? What is it? You have... You, you, you're making a fool of yourself. I mean, Clyde is making a fool of... That you. isn't what you were going to say. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. I know my brother better than you. He isn't serious about you. Why, he's never been serious about any woman. He never will be. He isn't the type. Believe me, he doesn't love you. I don't believe you. I know he loves me. I know. And I'm going to marry him. Marry him? Yes. You poor girl. I'm terribly sorry for you. Clyde was here a few minutes ago. I asked him about you, and he told me that he wasn't in love with you. You see, my dear... He's engaged to another woman. He's going back in the morning to be married. Married? If, if he had been serious, he'd have told you the truth. I'm sorry this had to happen to you. I have tried my best to keep you from falling and... It... What did you say? Go on, finish. Well, I said that... Oh, please, Doreen, don't become upset. You tried to keep me from falling in love. That's what you were going to say. Doreen, you must... Why didn't you want me to fall in love? Why? No, 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 Doreen, control yourself. Do you know what I'm thinking? Doreen. I despise you. I hate you. Oh, no, you don't understand. You don't want me to marry Clyde. You don't want me to marry anybody. And I know why. You're lying to me. You told him something to drive him away. I've told him nothing, and I'm not lying to you. I'll find out in just a moment. Wait, Doreen, wait. I, uh... I didn't want to tell you, but I see now that I must. You see, my dear, you've... You've inherited a complex, something that lies dormant and may be brought into action under emotional stress. Inherited a complex? Yes. A tendency to murder. Murder? And that's why I've tried to keep you from falling in love, from subjecting yourself to emotional stress. So that's what you told him. Another lie. Oh, no. <laughs> so I've inherited a desire to kill. Does anyone else know that? I... Yes, I had to tell Irving. I see. Good night. Oh, I... I beg your pardon, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, no, no, no. Come come in, Irving. Come in. I wanted to talk to you about... Hello, Doreen. <laughs> I said... What's the matter with you, Doreen? Nothing. Nothing is the matter. You, you look as though you... Doreen, what is it? Are you ill? Yes. Yes, I am ill. Haven't you heard? Doreen! Good night, both of you. What's wrong with her? I've never seen her like this. Do you suppose... I had to tell her, Irving, I had to. Then it's happened. She snapped. I can tell. I don't know what to do now. I just talked to Clyde. I told him he had to leave at once. The sooner the better. And I... I told him why. I told him about Doreen. I begged them to go for her sake. He only laughed at me. Told me to tend to my own business. Oh, Clyde tells her the truth, which he will. She's liable to snap completely. What can we do? I know what to do. When Clyde tells her, she'll turn violently against him. He's got to leave on the first train in the morning, but tonight she may do something. I'll change rooms with Clyde after she talks to him. What can I do? Nothing, Irving. Just try to forget it. Oh, uh, you can get me some coffee. I've got to stay awake tonight. <laughs> What is it? I want to ask you something, Clyde. What? Are you leaving in the morning? Well, uh, yes, Doreen, I am. Why? I have some business to attend to. Why are you leaving me, Clyde? Why don't you take me with you? Take you? But I can't do that. Why didn't you tell me you were leaving? Well, it, it came up all of a sudden. Oh, did it? What did your brother tell you about me? Well, he, he didn't tell me anything. No? 
I love you, Clyde. But I... You can't leave without me. I can't take you with me, Doreen. It's impossible. Why is it? Because, well, because I'm going to be married. Married? Yes. I wanted to tell you, but... Married? I thought you loved me, Clyde. Oh, Doreen, I can't stay here any longer. I, I can't go on like this. Why didn't you tell me you love someone else? Why? I don't know. I, I really don't know. Are you afraid of me? I'm leaving in the morning, Doreen. That, that's definite. Good night, Clyde. Doreen, I... I... Goodbye, darling. Now, the next morning. Breakfast is set early since the first train leaves at 8.30. At 7, Doreen, her face pale, deep shadows under her green eyes, comes slowly down the stairs to the sunroom. Good morning, Doreen. Good morning. Sit down, Doreen. Did you rest well? No. I didn't sleep so well either. Guess the storm disturbed me. Was there a storm? Yes, an electrical storm. Didn't you hear it? I don't remember. What time does the train leave? 8.30. Clyde will be down in a few minutes. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Yes? Mr. Bolton would like to see you. Oh, tell him to come in. Morning, Mr. Mitchell. Morning, Bolton. This is Mr. Davis, my assistant. This is Dr. Upton. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, gentlemen, this is my daughter, Doreen, and this is my superintendent, Irving Wallace. Yes, I know. How are you, Irving? What? What are you doing here? May we see the body, Mr. Mitchell? Yes, Sheriff. Sheriff? Body? Well, what's happened? Clyde has been murdered. Clyde? Murdered? Why, uh, Murdered? Yes. During the night. Clyde? <laughs> Come along, gentlemen. Upstairs. The sheriff and his deputy make the routine inspection of the room and the body. And after the coroner completes his examination, they return to the breakfast room. I'm afraid I'm to blame for this unfortunate circumstance. My wife begged me to keep her from emotional upset. I did my best, but I'm afraid it wasn't enough. I never dreamed she was falling in love with Clyde. When I learned about it, it was too late. I made a mistake by telling her. Only upset her the more. Say she inherited this tendency to kill from her father? Yes. Her mother made me promise to guard her carefully until she was 30. You see, it only appears in the early 20s, if at all. It lies dormant and may be brought to the fore by emotional stress. Oh, I see. Too bad. Did you leave your room last night, miss? What? Uh, no. That is... I, I don't remember. You were in love with him. And you didn't know about the other woman? I loved him. I didn't know about the other woman until last night. I didn't kill Clyde. You have no recollection of leaving your room? No, I... Will you come to town with us, miss? Why? Oh, we just want to talk to Wait. you. Wait. Wait, I can't stand this any longer. Doreen, why, she didn't kill Clyde. I know. I killed him. You? But... Here we go again, Doc. You're trying to protect her, I mean, because you love her. I do love her. Sure you do. Where's the gun? Gun? There's no gun. Clyde wasn't shot. No? No. I killed him with a sickle. A sickle from my tool shed. Now, do you believe me? Has he seen the body, Mr. Mitchell? No, I didn't say how he was killed, but Irving... I you killed can... him. I knew about Doreen, and I wanted to save her because I, I, I was jealous of Clyde. Well, he was killed with a sickle, all right. Yes, my sickle, from the tool shed. Now, do you believe me? Do you know what you're saying, Irving? I think he's shooting in the dark. No, and I can prove it. If Doreen had entered that room and stabbed anyone, she would have killed Henry. Not Clyde, but Henry. Why? Because Henry was afraid of what might happen during the night. So he changed rooms with Clyde. And I was the only one who knew that. Doreen would have killed Henry. Is that true, Mr. Mitchell? Why, yes, we did change rooms, but... And she didn't know that. Well, I don't know how she could have known it, but she must have discovered the switch. You know, I think Irving knows too many details to be lying. I think he's telling the truth. I am. I killed him. He didn't. Irving didn't kill him. He is trying to protect me. I remember something now. Remember what? If you killed him, Irving, what time was it? It was... 4 a.m. Have you established the hour of death, Doctor? I have. Wait, I'll tell you. It was... It was at midnight. 12 o'clock. What time was he killed, Doc? About 12 o'clock last night. Couldn't possibly have been 4. How did you know that? At midnight, I went to Clyde's room to talk to him. I was awakened by a horrible dream. It, it frightened me, so I went to his room. Clyde wasn't there. No one was there. So if Henry was occupying that room, and he was not there at midnight... Henry must have been in Clyde's room. What? Henry must have killed Clyde. What? You... Oh, why would I kill my own brother? For the same reason you killed my mother. Oh, nonsense. I've been suspicious of you ever since Mother died. What? I know you've looted my estate. Now, look. That's why you didn't want me to marry. 
And you were your brother's only heir. He was wealthy and his money could save you. You knew I was suspicious of you. Why, this is ridiculous. So you killed Clyde for his money and tried to blame it on me because you knew I'd be suspected. That's why you told Irving about my hereditary tendency. Why, why, why she's crazy, gentlemen, completely insane. Examine my mother's body. Check the account. She's mad, Mr. Mitchell, do you believe she inherited this tendency to murder? Why... Well, certainly, her, her mother warned me of all this. Uh, you're a biologist, aren't you, Mitchell? Oh, well, yes. Yes, I, I was. You still are, Dr. Henry Mitchell. Well, I still dabble in biology, uh, only as it concerns agriculture. Mm-hmm. I recently read an article you wrote a few years ago in which you proved the one thing that was not hereditary was a criminal instinct. That such tendencies were the results of environment. You proved that. Well... And you knew from the beginning that the mother was merely a victim of a false belief. But you used that belief to suit your own purpose. It all adds up against you, Mitchell. We'll just follow through with the girl's advice about your wife's body. I wouldn't be at all surprised by the results of the autopsy. Let's go, Doc. And they did follow through on Doreen's advice. And they did find her estate rifle. And they found traces of poison in the mother's body. So Henry confessed. If it hadn't been for Doreen's psychic powers, he'd have gotten away with everything. Oh, yes, Doreen was definitely psychic. Because she said she went to the room at midnight and no one was there. But she did not go to the room. But she did wake up with a start at midnight. She knew something terrible was happening. But didn't know what it was till this morning. She put things together and knew the truth. And Irving knew about the sickle because he missed it from its rack. And he was merely guessing. But it all worked out to a successful conclusion. And Doreen need have no further worry about her so-called inherited criminal tendency. Because there is no such thing. I know. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler... We'll return to tell you another unusual story. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Listening to Bellagio, rumble.com slash C slash G A R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Coal dealers of America. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Before the shadow begins today's adventure, let me ask you. Are you householders starting the new year the blue coal way? I hope so, because blue coal is America's finest home fuel. It gives you steady, even, helpful heat with the least effort. For you see, the blue coal way is the easy way to heat your home. Blue coal requires less attention, gives you greater heating comfort at less cost. What's more, an order of blue coal entitles you to the full benefit of extra home heating service. So phone your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow, won't you? Start the new year the easy, economical, blue coal way. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's story, 
The Ghost on the Stair. It is evening. We find Margot and Lamont seated on the veranda of a small hotel. They are conversing with the proprietors, Roger Miller and his wife, Adele. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Adele, I should say that you and Roger have discovered the ideal way to live. Really, yeah? Lamont? Yes, I should be quite content to change places with you. No. I'd like nothing better than to spend my days just sitting here on the veranda, observing the daily life of this delightful old southern town. Oh, here, here. Listen to old Pappy Cranston. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's oh, the cross I have to bear. Margot just doesn't understand me. Oh, oh, I know you too well, my friend. Oh, is that so? Yes, you'd be running this hotel for five minutes when up would pop a murder or a crime or a mystery, and you'd be off to the races again. <laughs> well, if it's a mystery he wants, he wouldn't have to leave the premises. <laughs> well, what do you mean, Roger? Oh, forget it. Now, there you see. One sniff and he's on the trail. Uh, don't pay any attention to my facetious femme, Roger. Uh, what were you referring to? Oh, it's not very exciting, Lamont. Our mystery is why we can't get the guests to stay at the hotel. Well, it's not really a mystery, Roger. Why don't you tell them the whole story? Yes, please do. Well, as you know, about a month ago, I inherited this place from my uncle. Yes, I remember. Since we've taken possession, no guest has ever stayed here more than one night. What? I said that no guest has ever stayed more than one night. Well, why is that, Roger? Because there's a ghost legend, a jinx on the place. A jinx that's lasted for almost a hundred years. Oh, it's not really a jinx, Roger. Now, what else would you call it, Adele? We're not making a go of it, are we? There's only one reason for our failure, isn't there? No, what is this reason? It's the house itself, the evil reputation that it bears. Well, I may be a bit dull, but I don't follow you. Well, this wasn't always a hotel, Margot. It was originally a plantation. A hundred odd years ago, it was owned by a family named Branch. During the Civil War, it was used as a hospital by the Confederate forces. It was in that period that the tragic event occurred that has placed a curse on this dwelling down through time to the present day. Well, what was this thing? What happened? Uh, a young Union soldier was a prisoner in the hospital. His nurse was the daughter of the house, Becky Branch. And you can guess what happened. They fell in love? Yes. The boy was fond of music, and every night Becky Branch would play for him on the spinet. One night, as she sat playing, the boy softly called out to her. Becky... Becky. Oh, yes, John. The doctor told me today that my wound was practically healed. Your wound? But, John, that means... Yes, it, it means that they'll be taking me away from here, Becky, to a prison. No. No, they can't do that. But they can and they will, unless... Unless what? Unless I can escape. John. Oh, it's the only thing left here. If I can just get out of this building, I have a good chance of reaching the Union lines. But, John, what of us? Oh, I'll come back for you, dear. After the war is over, you, you know I will. Yes. Yes, I do know that. Then will you help me? Help me to escape? Yes, John. I know of a way. A way for you to get out. Young Becky Branch plotted his escape. Finally, after a tearful farewell, the boy prepared to leave. I'll just keep playing. They'll think you're still here with me, John. All right. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Goodbye. John. Oh, my dearest. My dearest. John. John. John, what happened? John. John. Oh. Oh, John. And that's the story. The boy was dead, stabbed through the chest. No one who could have committed the murder was to be seen. Well, that sounds fantastic. Becky Branch's part in the attempted escape was discovered, and she was banished from the community. But what does that have to do with the jinx? Just this, Lamont. Since that day, this house has passed through many hands. In each family that has lived here, a mysterious death has occurred. Each of these deaths has been caused by a stabbing. Well, that is a story. Yeah, but that isn't all, Margot. Before each death occurred, the playing of a spinet was heard. The legend reenacted, eh? Well, have you heard this mysterious music since you've been here? No, not yet. Yeah. May I clear away the glasses, sir? Oh, yes, yes, the thought, very good. Yes, sir. And now, Lamont, if I haven't been too boring, that's the reason why you should stay out of the hotel business. <laughs> well, you've got a point there. Well, I think we'll turn in, if you'll excuse us. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, coming, Adele? Yes, dear. I guess it is bedtime. Good night, Margot. Good night, Lamont. Adele. Good night, Adele. See you in the morning. All right. Lamont, do you believe that story? Well, I don't know, Margot. There's always a legend that goes with these old places. 
Some of them are false. But this one's true, sir. Oh, I forgot you were here, Beauregard. Well, how do you know it's true, Bo? Well, I've been here many years, ma'am. I've heard that music many times. You have? Yes, sir. I've even seen the ghost. What ghost? The ghost that's always seen on the stairs. Ghost of Miss Becky Branch. Lamont. Lamont, listen. Am I hearing things? No. No, I hear it, too. Yeah, there it is, sir. There that old spinet playing again. Come on, Margot. We're going to look into this. But it seems to be coming from inside the house. Yes. Margo. Yes? Wait here a moment till I locate the sound. That room. It's coming from that room right over there. Yes. Let's walk quietly now. You mustn't be heard. Come on. What if... What if it really is the ghost? Would you rather wait outside, Martha? No. Stay right here. When I open this door... I'm going to rush quickly into the room. If I encounter trouble, you go for help. Yes, all right. Right, here we go. Hello. Oh, what? What is this? Oh, I... I beg your pardon. I I thought that you were a... Uh, uh, I'm terribly sorry. Well, that's quite all right. Lamont, are you all right? Yes, of course. Come in, Margo. Uh, keep right on playing, sir. I'm just showing the young lady about. Uh, this is the music room, I believe. Yes, I presume it is. I've only been a guest here since this afternoon, so I wouldn't be sure. Oh, I, I see. Uh, please continue your play. Thank you. I have traveled many miles to play in this old room. Really? Well, why is that? Because of the legend of this house. Have you ever heard of it? Yes. It was just told to us a while ago. In fact, we thought that you were... I mean... You thought I was the ghost of Becky Branch? <laughs> no. But I have come here to seek inspiration from her departed spirit. Oh. Oh, I see. I'm a composer. I've come to this old room because here I can sense the presence of the departed. Perhaps, perhaps my music will even woo the ears of the lovely ghost. Yes. Yes, that's very interesting. The beauty of the music of the dead is beyond compare. What was that? Someone in trouble. Yes, come along. Maybe that's your ghost. Oh, now, you must calm oh, down, Mrs. Down, Turner. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset everyone. He was, he was just so startling. Uh, what's Did the I... trouble? What happened? Hold them out. Oh, this is Mrs. Turner, a guest here at the hotel. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Was it you that screamed, Mrs. Turner? Yes. What yes, was wrong? Was. Well, I, I was on my way to my room, and I, I happened to glance down the stairwell and saw a woman coming up the stairs to the second floor. Yes? Thinking it was Mrs. Miller, I went to greet her. When I reached the head of the stairs... There was no one there. What? My. No, it... But it was such a shock that I... Well, I just screamed, I guess. Was it you, Adele? No, indeed. I was in my room. Oh, I see. Well, are there any other women guests in the hotel, Roger? No, no others. Well, perhaps you just imagined you saw someone, Mrs. Turner. No. I'm positive I saw a woman. <laughs> of course you did. What? She saw the ghost. The ghost of Becky Branch. What did you say, Mr. Simeon? It was Mrs. Turner's privilege to see a very old resident of this house, the spirit of Becky Branch. What's he saying? Are there really ghosts here? Well, of course not. That's not true, Mrs. Miller. Now, what makes you so sure of that? If you want proof of my statement, Mr. Miller, just be awake and listening at the witching hour of three. Why? What will happen? You will hear music. Lovely music. Played on the spinet by the ghost that Mrs. Turner saw on the stair. Now, look here, Mrs. Simeon. You're not frightening us, so why don't you stop your little game? Yes, we're all getting upset over nothing. I'd advise that we all go to bed. I agree, Lamont. We can go to bed. We can lock our doors. But we can't lock the ghost out. Come, come now, Mrs. Turner. You're oh, all upset. Come along. I'll see you to your room. You're right, Adele. Come along, Margot. All right. 
We'll let these good people get some sleep. I know. Good night, everyone. Good night. I warned you. Good night. I warned you. Hey, Lamont, did you really mean to make light of that little episode? Only to ease the poor woman's mind. Do you suppose she really saw someone? I don't know. But there's a more important question to be answered. What's that? I'd like to know just where Mr. Simeon has acquired his extensive knowledge of the habits of the so-called ghost of Becky Branch. Yes, I noticed that he seemed to know the whole story. He knew much more about it than Roger Miller does. I think, Margot, that our Mr. Simeon is going to be called on to answer a few questions by the shadow. Perhaps before the night is over, we'll have our ghost. What was that? I hope I'm not intruding, Mr. Simeon. Who speaks to me? Men call me... The Shadow. Where are you? I see no one. I'm standing right here beside you. I... I don't understand. Mr. Simeon, I have the power to make myself quite invisible to your eyes. What do you want of me? Why are you here? I want you to answer a few questions. What about? How do you know so much about the legend of this old house? Where did you hear of Becky Branch? What is that to you? Answer my question, Mr. Simeon. <laughs> Very well. Very well, I'll tell you. I was born in this house, Mr. Shadow. I spent my early youth here. I used to play on this very same spinet. Was there any evidence then of this so-called ghost? Oh, yes. We heard her many times, many times. She played so beautifully. Was she ever seen? Only as she was seen tonight, on the stairs. Do you believe this legend? Of course. I have very good reason to believe it. Why? On the second floor, by the staircase, my father was found, my stepfather, stabbed to death. Who did it? Who killed him? We never found out. He died just as the young soldier died on the very same spot. <laughs> it was a blessing, though. I never liked my stepfather. You wanted him to die? I didn't care. Why have you returned here? I'm seeking inspiration. Yes. <laughs> The inspiration that I lost when I left here. Inspiration that can only be gotten from the spirit of Becky Branch. Listen for her tonight. It usually comes from the cellar below. At the witching hour of three. I don't believe that you've come back here in search of an inspiration, Mr. Simeon. You have another motive. And when I learn what it is, let me warn you. You will receive another visit from the shadow. What is Mr. Simeon's true motive? We'll find out in just a moment. But first, here's a question that's near a home. Have you ever asked yourself, how can I cut down my coal bills this winter? Well, the answer to that question is blue coal. For not only does blue coal burn steadily and last longer, but with every order of blue coal, you get free heating advice that helps you cut your home heating expenses. These helpful hints come to you as an extra courtesy extended by your friendly blue coal dealer. And he offers you another aid to economy, the blue coal automatic heat regulator. Its initial cost is surprisingly low, and it pays for itself over again in the fuel it saves you. A blue coal heat regulator working with blue coal makes the perfect heating combination. For blue coal gives you better heat with less attention. And the heat regulator saves unnecessary trips by automatically opening and closing the dampers on your furnace. Phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow and ask him to show you this easy, economical way to heat your home. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. And now, back to the shadow. Lamont. Yes, 
Yes, Margot. What do you expect to find down here in the cellar? Well, according to Mr. Simeon, this is where the ghostly music has come from. Here, uh, take this other flashlight. All right. Well, did you learn anything else from Simeon? Yes. He lived here as a child. His stepfather was killed in this house. Stabbed to death just as the soldier was stabbed. And he met his death on the second floor landing by the staircase. Is that where the soldier died? According to Simeon, yes. Huh. Well, I don't see anything down here that looks like a musical instrument, do you? No. Do you believe Simeon's story? Well, I think he told the truth about living here and his stepfather's death, but... Well, he's... Talk of ghosts was, well, not very believable. Somebody come, please. Tell us, the old servant, Beauregard. He's calling from upstairs. Let's get up there, Margo, quickly. Oh, Lordy. Lordy, oh. What is it, Bo? What's the trouble? Look there, Mr. Cranston. It's Mr. Simeon. Yes, sir. Hey, you better not look, Margo. It's Simeon. He... He's been stabbed in the chest. Oh, oh, is he dead? Yes. Oh, Lord, he's just like the Yankee soldier. Just like what happened to him. The ghost done it. That's what... Be quiet, Bo. What's wrong here? Why were you calling out, Bo? Look, Master, look. Uh, Good yeah. heavens. What happened? Simeon was stabbed in the chest. He, he's dead. How did it happen? I don't know. Uh, when did you discover this, Bo? I just come walking down the hall, sir, and they were stretched out like you see him now. Oh, I see. Oh, Roger... You sleep on this floor, don't you? Yes. Did you hear anything? Sound of a struggle or a fight? No, not a thing. Oh. Well, we'd better call the police at once. Well, that certainly was a fine investigation, Lamont. Yes. I'd hate to see that sheriff in charge of a crime wave ever hit this Tom. <laughs> He'd probably handle it just as he did tonight, Margo. He'd just say... I told the body we ain't come back in the morning when it can rustle up a coroner's jury. <laughs> yes, in the meantime, the murderer has a perfect opportunity to cover up any traces of his crime. Exactly. I must say, though, that I haven't any more leads to work on than the good sheriff had. No, Mr. Simeon was your number one suspect in this ghost business, wasn't he, Lamont? Yes. I felt that he knew much more about what went on here than he was willing to tell. Maybe that's why he was killed. Well, that's quite possible. But who could his murderer be? There are only four other people in this house. Oh, Beauregard, Mrs. Turner, Adele, and Roger. Yes. Roger. Did I hear you mention my name? Oh. Roger. Oh, sorry, Margot. I didn't mean to startle you. I heard your voices, so I came in to see if you'd uncovered anything. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm afraid we haven't. Well, I guess we'll have to wait till morning now. Oh, say, uh, why don't you two get some sleep? We will presently, Roger. Well, uh, good night. Good night. Good night, Roger. Lamond. Yes, Margo? Wasn't it strange the way Roger just popped in here like that? Yes. There are several other points about Roger that need clearing up in my mind. What do you mean? Don't you think it odd that he didn't hear any sounds when Simeon died? His room was right on that floor. Yes. And why did he take so long in responding to Bo's call for help? I thought of that, too. If you don't mind, Margo, we won't be retiring for some time yet. There are many things here that require investigation before the night is over. Well, what are you going to do, Lamont? Well, first of all, Simeon told me that the ghostly music was always heard at the witching hour of three. It's almost that now, isn't it? Yes, yes, just about. Well, I think we should stay up for that little recital. Let's sit out here by the staircase. All right. I, uh, I'm afraid I'll have to turn out this light. That's all right, Lamont. Just, just stay near me, that's all. All right. Now, follow me. Take hold of my hand. If we ever meet a ghost now, I'm afraid that I'll... Now, Margo, now, now. Here. Sit here on the stair. Thanks. What was that? There was an owl outside the house. Oh. Well, I wish he'd get a sore throat or something. I can't stand it. Shh. Well... According to Mr. Simeon's story, it's time now for the concert to be... Lamont, there it is. Yes. Quiet now. See if we can locate the sound. It's not coming from the music room. No. No, it, it seems to come from up above. Somewhere on the upper floors. Well, why don't we get... Come on, Margo. Something's oh. happened up there. There's a light switch on the wall, Margo. I've got it. Uh. It's Roger. Uh. Yes. 
Call Adele quickly. What's happened to him? The same wound in the chest. He's breathing, though. There may be a chance of saving him. Go, please. Get, get Adele. Yes, all right. All right, old man. Now, just take it easy. Lie quietly, please. That's it. Take it easy. Must, must tell you. Must tell you. Uh, what, what are you trying to say? Passage way. See? Secret. Passage way. Where? Where is this passage? R Roger. Roger. What's happened to him? Oh, Roger, what's happened? He's still alive, Adele, uh, but we must act quickly. Call a car. He must be gotten to a hospital at once. It was much more important that Adele be regained consciousness to call us at once. Well, Lamont, this passageway he spoke of, did he tell you where it was? No, but it must be somewhere in this hall. We'll try all of these panels. All right, I'll start at this end. All right. If we can locate the source of the ghostly music, I think our mystery will be solved. Lamont? Huh? Lamont, I think I found something. Come here a minute. Uh, what is it? See? This wooden decoration is loose. And it seems to pull down. Yes. Uh, wait, Margot. Let me do it. I can do it. It's opening. Margot, look out! <coughs> oh, that was a narrow escape, Margot. That knife almost plunged into your body. Oh, what happened, Lamont? I think we've discovered our weapon of death, Margot. That, that knife? Yes. We've also solved a murder that is over 70 years old. The murder of Becky Branch's sweetheart. I don't understand. I'll release the weapon and show you. The weapon that also killed Mr. Simeon and wounded Roger Miller. Well, how was this done? Well, it's quite simple. This knife is really an old bayonet. It's attached to that heavy spring, which was released when the secret door was opened. I see. It was evidently put there years ago to prevent the escape of men like Becky Branch's soldier. And through the years, it's taken the lives of all those who discovered the passageway. Why, that's amazing. But, Lamont, that doesn't explain the supernatural happenings in this house. Yes, I know that. That's something that we must... Listen, the music again. Yes. And this time I'm going to trace it to its source. It seems to be coming from somewhere in this passage. You wait here, Margot. This is a job for the shadow. If I play, he'll return. He must return. But it's been so long. Old woman. Did someone speak? I did. What are you doing in this house? Playing my spinet. Who are you? Well, I'm Becky. Becky Branch? John. John, it's you. It's you. You've come back for me at last. You are Becky Branch? Yes. Don't you know me, John? Don't you remember me? I've gotten older. I've been waiting for you so long, so many years. You've been waiting here, in this house? It's just at night. Only in the night I return here. They sent me away, John. They sent me away when you escaped. You remember that night when I played for you as you left? I was away for many years. Then I returned. No one in the village knew me. I could go and come as I pleased. So I came to the house here at night by the cellar entrance and played just as I'm playing now, hoping that someday my playing would bring you back to me. You've waited many years. Many years, John. But it's all worthwhile now. You come back to me. You come back to me. I'm so glad. Now I, I won't have to. Happy to hear that Roger's doing so well, Adele. He's doing splendidly. The doctor thinks he can come home by the end of the week. Good, oh, good. good. 
Oh, uh, you might be interested to know that some of the older residents of the town arrange for a decent burial for Becky Branch. Oh, I'm so glad. Adele, did Lamont tell you that he found an entrance in the cellar that Becky used to use to enter this house? So that's how she got in. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, and uh, we finally learned how the secret panel worked, too. How? When the panel was opened, the spring that held the knife was released. Oh, I see. And after the stabbing, the door sprang shut, returning the knife to its former position. Well, dinner is so, Mrs. Oh, Miller. thank you, Bo. You know, there's one point that you haven't cleared up yet, Lamont, and that's the ghost on the stair. Oh, Margo, I... I'm afraid I have no answer for that. Yeah, I can explain that, Mr. Cranston. Oh, can you, Bo? Yes, sir. That was the real ghost. More from the shadow in just a minute. But first, here's John Barclay, America's home heating expert. Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good evening, friends. You know... Every good housewife takes a kind of pride in her kitchen. She installs the best cooking equipment she can afford. And she keeps her kitchen clean and immaculate. Well, that's as it should be. But you men don't have to let the ladies get ahead of you. No, sir. You can have your cellar just as modern and clean and immaculate as your wife's kitchen. And it won't cost you anything either. As a matter of fact, you'll save money. Just by following the advice I've given thousands of other householders. Ask your blue coal dealer for the free services of a John Barclay trained serviceman. He'll tell you in a few simple words just how to bring the furnace you've had for years right up to date. He'll show you the clean and easy way to operate your furnace. And most important of all, he'll show you how to cut down the cost of heating your home. So if you've not already benefited from this free John Barkley heating service, just phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow. Thank you. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. (laughs) Next week, same time, same station, the Blue Coal Dealers of America bring you an adventure of the shadow unequaled for sheer terror and stirring dramatic action. So be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your friendly Blue Coal Dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. This is Ken Roberts saying, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. The Kraft Foods Company brings you The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Irene. No, I can't see you tonight. I'm all hung up. Yeah, some girl likes my looks. Well, Angel, she must think I'm pretty as a picture, because she's certainly out to frame me. This is Ed Hurley, friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Careless Client. Before the Falcon solves tonight's case, let's listen to this. Miracle Whip. Has a flavor so pleasing. Miracle Whip. Tastes so lively, so teasing. Miracle Whip. Only one of its kind. Miracle Whip. Best salad dressing you'll find. Miracle Whip tastes really good. Not too sharp, not too mild, but just exactly right. And Miracle Whip tastes different, too. Different from any other salad dressing. Try it yourself. See why it's America's favorite salad dressing. 
the one and only Miracle Whip. And now, the case of the careless client. It's early afternoon in New York, and a short, dumpy little man with lacquered hair walks down the second floor corridor of the Gordon Building until he comes to a door marked Daniel Russell, Private Investigations. Obviously, our unknown friend has been here before, for without any hesitation, he eases himself into Mr. Russell's office, and ease is the proper word, for Mr. Russell, with his back to the door and his ear glued tightly to the phone, doesn't even hear him. Now, look, Harris, you got to give me a break. You know I'm good for the money. Sorry, Russell, it's no dice. That's the gratitude I get, and after all the dough I've lost to you. All I ask is that you let me go on the cuff for another 20. I got a sure thing going on the 5th at Detroit. Now, where have I heard that before? Listen, Danny, why don't you do both of us a favor and stay away from the horses? Okay, Harris. You don't want to take my bets, I'll find a bookie who will. Yeah, name one. <clears throat> oh, uh... I beg your pardon. Uh, Harris, a client just walked in. I'll have to call you back later. I'm sorry if I interrupt, Mr. Russell. There's nothing important, Mr. Giuliano. Just one of my men checking in. Mm, I see. Sit down, won't you? Uh, you have something for me? Yes, indeed. I located your boy. Larry Stratton? Yep. Stratton's in New York, all right. Got here last week from Washington. First thing he did was to get himself a room under the name of Leonard Simons... Funny how they always keep the same initials. And where does my friend Mr. Stratton live? 1423 Carroll Place. It's a small rooming house. I uh, pumped the superintendent, but he couldn't tell me much. And incidentally, uh, that little talk cost me an extra 50. I got no complaints, Mr. Russell. You do fine. Fifty dollars, you say? That's right. Hey, that's quite a wad you're carrying, Giuliano. Must be at least 15 to 20 grand there. So? So you want to be careful? I am. How much do I owe you altogether? 150 bucks. You'd like to double it? I'd like nothing better. It's easy. I need some information from this Mr. Stratton. You got it for me. How? Oh, oh now, come on, Russell. You, you must have some idea. All you've got to do is work on him a little bit. Work on him? Yeah. You look like a boy who knows how to use his fists. Get out. <laughs> you make a big mistake. Go on, Giuliano, beat it. Okay, no harm's done. Just suppose we forget this little talk, huh? I'll think about it. You do that, Russell. You find it a lot healthier than talking. I'll be seeing you, fella. <laughs> No, you've, uh, you've got the wrong number. Now, look, Stratton, I haven't got time to horse around. I assure you, I'm risking a lot more than you are. Who is this? My name's Russell, Danny Russell. I'm a private detective. Up till a half hour ago, I was working for a man named Cesar Giuliano. Giuliano? That's right. He's probably on his way over to see you. I don't believe you. Now, look, don't be a sap. I told him where you were. He even offered me an extra 150 to take care of you. Now, the smart thing for you to do is to beat it. What kind of a fool do you take me for? Don't you think I know a trap when I see one? you got to believe me, Stratton. Why should I? How do I know you're not working with Giuliano? I can tell you, Larry. Giuliano. Hello, Stratton. Hang up. Hello, Stratton. That's fine, Larry. Shut the door, Coslo. Huh? Oh, sure. Now, listen, Giuliano. Good. You're going to tell me what I want to hear? You're wasting your time. Come here, Coslo. You, you want me, Mr. Giuliano? Yes. Coslo, this is Mr. Stratton. Hi. Mr. Coslo is a wrestler fellow, Larry. I meet him today in gymnasium. They say he can break your neck just like that. Yeah, just like that. But I think he's how you call a little punchy. Too many beatings in the head. You understand? Uh, what do you want uh, me to do, Mr. Giuliano? Get him out of here. Oh, you think I bring him here to be lesson for you? <laughs> Strictly between us, Larry, I wouldn't be surprised if you were right. Uh, 
Larry. Larry. Larry, where are I... <gasps> hey, hey, what's the matter, lady? Look. Holy smoke. Oh, Larry, Larry. Oh, he's still breathing. We'd better get a doctor. Where can I find one? Well, if you go down to the corner, you'll see... Oh, no, never mind. I'll get him myself. Oh, please. Sure. I'll be back as fast as I can. Oh. oh, Larry, darling, what happened? No, never mind, Eve. We're getting a doctor. Well, I don't want one. What? I said I don't want one. But, Larry... Sh shut the door, huh? All right. Now, now lock it. Now, listen to me, Eve. Candid way. No, no, in, in that... That medicine chest over the basin, there's a, there's a roll of adhesive tape. Will you get it for me? Yes. Is this what you want? No, there's, there should be a roll of half-inch tape. Uh, there's none here. Are you sure? Oh, no, I've got it. All right, bring it here. Take off the cover. All right, now open up the roll. Well, there are numbers written on this. Oh, and I didn't tell him. You didn't tell him what? I was afraid they beat it out of me, but they didn't. Darling, what is this all about? Honey, don't ask me any questions. Huh? Someone tried to kill you. You don't have to worry. Giuliano wouldn't dare while he hasn't got this. Giuliano? Caesar Giuliano. Who is he, Larry? What does he want no, please, of you? Please, please, don't ask me. Don't ask me. I, I shouldn't have even told you that. Oh. I'm in trouble, Eve. I'm in real trouble. Why don't you go to the police? I can't. But why not? I can't tell you. Well, then, hire a private detective. What good would that do? Oh, darling, obviously, you need protection. I can take care of myself. Larry, you've got to. Now, he wouldn't have to be told anything. I I could make up some sort of story. Now, there's a man named Mike Waring. I've heard about him. That the one they call the Falcon? Yes. He's supposed to be very competent. But you're not being fair to him, Eve. If this Waring doesn't know what he's up against, he's liable to get himself killed. Darling, believe me, it's the only way. I'm sure nothing will happen to Mr. Waring, and if he does, well, well, he's paid to take the risk. Just a second. Mr. Waring? That's right. I'm Eve Lowry. I spoke to you a little while ago on the telephone. Oh, so you did. Come on in. Thank you. Sit down. Oh, really, I haven't much time. Will it take any less if you stand? Well, I guess you're right. Now, what can I do for you? I'm in trouble, Mr. Waring. What do you call trouble? Someone's trying to kill me. Well, that's a good enough definition. He's made several attempts on my life already. Who's he? A man named Caesar Giuliano. Why? Why? Well, I assume that making attempts on your life is more than a hobby with Mr. Giuliano, and... Does he have a reason? Well, you see, my... My father and Mr. Giuliano were partners. In what business? Importing. Mm -hmm. Go on. Well, Giuliano thought my father swindled him. Did he? Oh, of course not. Mm -hmm. Well, Giuliano swore to get even, but Dad died before he could. So Giuliano transferred his uh, affections to you. Hmm? Yes. Well, what would you like me to do about it? Well, what would you suggest? Oh, there are several possibilities. We could make out a complaint to the DA's office. Oh, no, I... I don't want to do that. I don't want any publicity. I see. Uh, do you know where this Giuliano is staying? Oh, I think it's at the Carlton Hotel. Why? I suppose I go up there and have a talk with him. Oh, no. Please don't do that. You don't seem to like any of my ideas. What's wrong with this one? Well, I don't see where it'll accomplish anything. Giuliano will probably deny knowing me. Look, Miss Lowry, if we're both going to worry about this, you're throwing your money away. I suppose you'll leave Mr. Giuliano to me and let me earn my fee, hmm? This is Ed Hurley here again, friends. I have a little suggestion for you ladies who wonder what you're going to do for some interesting menu ideas. And my suggestion is this. Just get a two-pound loaf of Kraft Smooth Melting Pasteurized Processed Cheese Food, Velveeta. You can melt Velveeta for smooth, delicious cheese sauce 
that'll add extra goodness to vegetables or seafood or rice or just plain toast for a fine main dish. And it's such an easy sauce to make. All you do is melt a half pound of Velveeta in the top of your double boiler. Notice how smooth it melts without any lumps at all. Then slowly stir in a quarter of a cup of milk, season to your taste, and there you have it. A delicious cheese sauce with a wonderful, rich, yet mild cheddar cheese flavor. A flavor that everyone, the youngsters and grandma included, will enjoy often. And it's a wholesome dish, because Velveeta is so rich in important food values from milk. So whether you melt Velveeta for a swell cheese sauce or slice it thick for hearty sandwiches, you'll find Velveeta is a mighty handy helper, Mother. Get a two-pound loaf tomorrow, won't you? It's America's favorite cheese food, the one and only Velveeta, made by Kraft. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. An hour has passed since Mike Waring went to work for Eve Lowry, who claimed her life was being threatened by a man named Caesar Giuliano. That's all Mike needed. Being a man of action, he goes right to the seat of the trouble. Who is it? Room service. I didn't order anything. Your name Giuliano? Yes. That's what the order blank says. Just a second. Hello. You're no waiter? No. Nope. The oldest trick in the world. Apparently, it still works. What's your name, mister? Mike Waring. You're not the private detective fellow I hear about. Why not? Why you play games? I want you to stop annoying my client. Your client? Mm-hmm. What did he tell you? He? Well, sure, you... Just who are you working for, Waring? Eve Lowry. Eve Lowry? I suppose you'll deny knowing her. And... I am suppose I do. Well, it won't wash, Juliano. What have you got against the girl? Well, it's a long story, Wary. I'd like to show you something. Get away from that desk, Juliano. But I just want to show you this. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Oh, come, Wary. A big boy like you, he's not scared of a little gun like this. No, but I've got a lot of respect for it. I don't blame you. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to hear more about your client. Client? This Eve Lowry you mentioned. Never heard of her. Oh, you're going to play it like that, eh? What else can I do? Let go, you fool! Let go! Come on, Giuliano, drop it! I... <coughs> you stupid fool! How many times must I tell you, let go? <coughs> Yeah? I'm uh, looking for a private dick named Danny Russell. What can I do for Hey, you're hurt. Sit down. Thanks. Called you a doctor. No, don't bother. Just saw one. Say, you you wouldn't have a drink in this place, would you? Yeah, right in this desk. I'll get you a glass. No, no. Never mind. Hey, hey, hey. Go easy, mister. That stuff's been aged in the wood. <laughs> you mean that desk drawer? Feel any better? Yeah. What happened to your hand? I got it caught in a cash register. Who are you kidding? Never mind. You come pretty highly recommended, Russell. And yeah, by whom? A man named Caesar Giuliano. Did you do some work for him? Get out. What's the matter? Get out of here. You're a friend of Giuliano's. Now, I... Take it easy. I never said I was. Well, I thought he shot me up and then beat it. When I came to, I went through some of his papers and found your name. What did he hire you for? Let's see your buzzer, Mister. I'm not a cop. My name is Mike Waring. Waring? The Falcon, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a pleasure. You know, you're almost a legend in town. Yeah, me and the Giants. What can I do for you? Well, I'd like a little information. What kind of a job did you do for Giuliano? Routine skip tracing. Wanted me to locate a guy named Larry Stratton. Larry Stratton, huh? Why? Well, first he told me Stratton skipped out of Mexico, owing him some dough on a business deal. Then he offered me 150 bucks to beat some information out of him this on the level? I don't joke about things as sacred as money. He had a roll on him that could choke a horse. Did uh, Giuliano mention a girl named Eve Lowry? No. How's she fit in? I wish I knew. Look, Russell, I've got a proposition. 
How about the two of us joining forces? I'll see you don't suffer by it. You just got yourself a boy, Waring. What do you want me to do? Know where I can locate Juliano? Have you tried the Carlton Hotel? <laughs> where do you think I picked up this slug? Wait a minute, I got an idea. When Juliano first approached me, I met him at a furnished room in Brooklyn. Well, what do you say we drive out to Brooklyn? Maybe worth the trip. <laughs> I think this is the place, Mike. Doesn't speak well for Brooklyn. Got a rod on you? Uh-uh. Don't believe in him. I do. I guess nobody's home. Got a gimmick? You're not thinking of forcing the lock, are you? No, I leave that to you. And hey, I'll look, Mike. Now, don't worry. If you get into trouble, I'll go halfies with you. Okay. How you coming? There. Got it now. like anybody's home. No. Well, as long as we're here, we might... Mike. Huh? Is that what I think it is? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Someone really poured a lot of lead into this boy. You recognize him? Sure. It's Giuliano. What are you doing? Going through his pockets. Find anything? No. Nothing but this scrap of paper. Larry Stratton, for Hey, that's the character Giuliano hired me to find. Well, now it looks as though he found Giuliano. Did you ask me? No, you're not imagining things. I heard it, too. Gesundheit. Coming from that closet. Yeah. Oh! All right, come on out. Stay away from me. Well, if it isn't Miss Lowry. You know her? Sure, this is my client, Eve Lowry. Where'd you get that gun, Angel? Never mind. The important thing is that I know how to use it. If you try to stop You're me, what? I'm... what? Oh. All right, Russell, get it. Got it. You hit me. What did you expect me to do? Applaud while you gave a demonstration on the use of firearms? What are you doing here? Come on, Eve, in case you hadn't noticed, there's a dead body in this room. All right, open up there. Uh... Come on, open up. Mike. Who is it? Police. Uh-oh. You can open up or do I have to break down this door? Just a minute. Listen, Russell. I want you to take Eve out of here. Why? You heard me through the fire escape. What about you? I'll stall them. Now, you drive back to Manhattan, see what you can learn about this Larry Stratton. No. Keep quiet. I don't know what you're getting into, Mike. I'll take my chances. Worst comes to worst, you can bring Eve down to local headquarters and we can straighten it all out. Okay. Come on, honey. No. Well, make up your mind, Angel. Do you go with him or do you stay here and face a murder act? Hey, what's going on in there? Open up. I'll go with him. Well, hurry it up. Lots of luck, Mike. Same to you. Well, what's going on here, wise guy? Why didn't you open that door? I was busy. Hey, who's that? man named Cesar Giuliano. Huh? Who are you? Mike Waring. Did you gun him? What do you think? I think yes. Come on, Waring, I want you to try out our local jail. I think you'll love it. <laughs> You can't hold me here. Yeah, but we are, aren't we? Well, there must be an answer to that. Well, when you think of it, let me know. Now, just a minute. I didn't kill Giuliano. And who did? I tell you, I don't know. And we're right back where we started. Not quite. Giuliano died around 6 o'clock, didn't he? How'd you know that? I heard the coroner talking. Well, I didn't get to that room till after 9. Suppose I told you a witness just turned up who says differently. Then you'd be lying. Okay. Hey, Bruce. What is it, Mike? Show the party in, will you? Eve. You recognize him, Miss Lowry? Yes. He's a private detective named Mike Waring. I hired him this afternoon to handle a matter for me with Cesar Giuliano. I never dreamt he'd go as far as he did. What are you talking about? Murder, Mr. Waring. You killed Giuliano. I what? Now, don't try to deny it. I saw you do it. And let's see you get around that. Remember, tomorrow at your grocer's, you can get a wonderful new salad oil for your homemade salad dressings, your cooking, your baking. It's Kraft Salad Oil. 
the first salad oil for home use ever offered by the makers of all those wonderful Kraft dressings. Kraft salad oil is a lighter-bodied oil, super fine to blend perfectly with other ingredients. Get a pint or quart bottle tomorrow at your grocer's. Ask for Kraft salad oil. <laughs> Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. A couple of hours have passed since Eve Lowry identified Mike Waring as the man who killed Cesar Giuliano. Now, once again, the cell door opens. Okay, Waring. What do you want now? Uh, that's no way to talk to a guy who's going to give you your freedom. What? Yeah. You can go whenever you like. Is this your idea of a rib? No, no, no. On the level. No, I don't get it. Hello, Mike. Russell. Sorry, I'm late. What happened? Your client made a sucker out of me. When I got her into the car, she heisted my gun. I never figured on her doubling back here. Did you let her go, officer? Yeah, we had nothing on her. We figured you to be the killer. Well, what convinced you otherwise? <laughs> Your friend Russell here. Now, why don't you tell me that at 6 o'clock when Juliana was shot, you and him were having a couple of beers at a joint. Russell and I... You Ar remember, Mike. It was right before we went over to see Harriet and Nora. Oh, Harriet and Nora, yeah, I... You didn't involve them. I couldn't help myself. No, I guess not. But the girls aren't going to like this. Uh, no hard feelings, Waring. Uh, no. None at all, officer. Let's go, Russell. So long, Mac. So long. Well, that was quick thinking, chum. Forget it. It was nothing. That's no way to talk about my neck. If you'll pardon the pun, I'm awfully attached to it. What do you intend to do now, Mike? Go back to Manhattan and find Eve Lowry. Any idea where? Yeah. There are two parties involved in this mess, Eve Lowry and Larry Stratton. Now, wouldn't it be strange if they were connected? What makes you think so? Just a hunch. And when I'm in a spot like this, I play him. Because, brother, I've got no other choice. Where's your grip, Larry? It's under the bed, Eve. Want me to pack all your suits? Well, I don't think you'll have room... I'll wear the chalk stripe. You can... Larry. Take it easy, honey. Who is it? Who is it? Just us. Mr. Waring. Uh-huh. Well, that hunch was right, Mike. What hunch? I had an idea you two went together like ham and eggs. Listen, Waring, I don't know what you want. But if you think Eve killed Juliana, you're out of your mind. She didn't even know the man. And why did she come to me with that cock and bull story? She was trying to protect me. Against what? Look, I'm, I'm head cashier in a Washington bank. Giuliano's been after me to turn over to him the dates of large currency movements. What was it, blackmail? No. Now, don't give me that. Otherwise, you would have gone to the police. What do they have on you? Don't tell him, Larry. What can I lose now, Eve? Giuliano found out that ten years ago I served a term for manslaughter. I was drunk one night and I killed a man with my car. I served two years under another name. And if the bank ever learned about you being an ex-con, you'd be minus a career, huh? That's right. Is that why she killed Juliana? I tell you, she didn't. Then who did? I did. Well, you mustn't believe him, Mr. Waring. He's trying to protect me. I killed Juliana. She's lying. It's no use, Larry. They're bound to find out sooner but or later. But you couldn't have done it because I did. What do you think, Russell? Oh. The cinch one of them's lying. Ah, but which one? She, she is. is. I don't believe oh, you. Wait, 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 wait. To... Just a minute. As far as Juliana was concerned, there's no great loss. He was a crook. But there's no reason why this has to go any further than this room. What do you mean? Well, Russell and I are fond of eating regularly. So, for five grand, we walk out of here, forget we ever knew you. That okay with you, Denny? I don't like it. Ah, oh, come on, give him a break. And two and a half grand apiece isn't to be sneezed at. Well, there's only one trouble with that, Waring. Trouble? I haven't got 5,000. Oh. How about you, Eve? I gave you my last $50. Well, how much can you dig up? Uh, Not more than a couple of hundred. Oh, well, that puts a different complexion on things. What do you think, Russell? I say we turn them over to the cops. Yeah, well, that's to be expected. Every killer likes a fall guy handy. What are you getting at? Just what it sounded like, Russell. Didn't anyone ever tell you you can't get away with murder? Really, Mr. Waring, I don't know how to thank you enough. Well, maybe you'll let me give the little bride away. You're not angry at me for involving you? No. 
Oh, after all, Eve, you're a woman in love, and they're not very rational creatures. Well, tell me, Mr. Waring, how did you figure out it was Vanny Russell who killed Giuliano? Oh, there were several things, Larry. First of all, Russell told me that Giuliano had a roll on him big enough to choke a horse. And when I went through Giuliano's pockets, all I found was a scrap of paper with your name on it. So what happened to the money? Well, obviously it was stolen. That's right. So that opened up a new field. Suppose this was a plain, everyday murder for money. But Larry or I might have taken it. No, not very likely, Angel. That's why I offered to accept the bribe. I figured that if you two were willing to risk the chair for each other, a little thing like $5,000 wouldn't stop you. If you had it. And when you heard the best we could scare up was a couple of hundred. Uh-huh, then I knew I had to look elsewhere. Uh-huh. Well, what made you think of Russell? Well, he got me out of jail by inventing an alibi for me. Something about a double date with a couple of girls named Harriet and Nora. Well, I don't understand. Well, you see, by giving me an alibi, he also gave himself one at the same time, and he really needed it. Oh. Now, the truth of the matter is that at 6 o'clock when Giuliano was shot, I was still out cold in his apartment after he plugged me. No wonder Russell made it so easy for me to escape from him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But you know what gets me, Angel, is what you were doing in the closet where we found you. Oh. Well, I drove out to see Giuliano hoping that if I pleaded with him, he wouldn't bother Larry anymore. When I got there, he was dead. Then when I heard you outside, I, I got panicky. Mm-hmm. And down at headquarters when you accused me of the murder? Well, that was for the same reason. I wanted to protect Larry. <laughs> sure, I should have known. Well, good night, Larry. Take care of yourself, Angel. Now, wait, wait a minute, Mr. Waring. Why rush off? Well, this is all okay for you lovebirds, but I've got a lot of work to do. At this time of night? Mm-hmm. I've got a date with one of the most luscious redheads in New York. You call that work? And you've got to explain why you're 24 hours late, brother. It's nothing else but. (laughs) Good night, folks. There comes a time in the life of every homemaker when she has to fix a dinner fast. And that's when Kraft Dinner is such a help. You see, in just seven minutes cooking time, Kraft Dinner makes delicious macaroni and cheese. Wonderful, tender macaroni with fine cheese flavor all through. Just like I said, in only seven minutes cooking time. That's because every package of Kraft Dinner gives you a special quick cooking macaroni and just the right amount of Kraft grated for that grand cheese flavor. So tomorrow, get a couple of packages of Kraft Dinner. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Until now, this story has been top secret. Top Secret, the new NBC presentation starring Ilona Massey, the world's most beautiful actress, as the Baroness Karen Gazer, in transcribed dramas of international intrigue and espionage before and during World War II. Tonight, as assignment two, The Admiral's Strange Identity, a story until now, Top Secret. Say anything else, sir. Just get in. What? Get inside. You are not serious. I heard the last two minutes of your conversation with Borland. The steward saw him come to this cabin. I know what you are and who you are. Get inside. I won't. Let go of me. Let me go. A vacation is not a painful death. Please, you don't know what you're doing. Let me go. You, you maniac. No. <laughs> I was half unconscious from the blow, but I felt him pick me up and put me in. He put the pillow over my face, blankets off the bed, stuffed in around me so I couldn't breathe. Then the lid came down, pressing, relentless, then darkness, nothing. The whole pattern of my life came into focus, stretching away into the past. 
I could hear the farmer running. In espionage perilous, there is no protection in danger, no recognition, even in death. <laughs> I accepted those conditions and became a spy. Two weeks ago, I was a Munich tourist in the Hotel Admon in Berlin, sending in daily reports of whatever information I could find. Then, I heard about Elsa Fremen. I found out who she was and what she was going to do. I got her measurements, her height, weight, and I asked the farmer to arrange for her detention. When he got her, he sent for me. I hurried to the little art shop on the back street in Berlin where the farmer was, waiting. Is that you, Karen? Yes. Come in. Karen, you can't go through with it. It's too dangerous. Did you get her? Two of the men picked her up last night. Where is she? She tried to escape. We shot her. Oh, no. Was it absolutely necessary? I'm afraid so. She would have escaped. Where are her clothes? They're there on the couch. I'll uh, change behind the screen. Go ahead and tell me everything. Karen, this is suicide. Changing places with Elsa Fromm is suicide. Tell me about her. Uh, her tickets are for a plane leaving Tebelhoff Aerodrome in a quarter of an hour. You were right about her size. Exactly like you. Waist, bust, shoes, everything. Did she wear any jewelry? No. Oh, how did she do her hair? Combed back, off the forehead. Did she wear nail polish? No. Have you any polish removal? Uh, no. Well, I can peel it off in the car on the way to the airport. Karen, this is insane. It's too dangerous. How about the makeup? She didn't wear any. She was drab, colorless, insipid. Karen, I won't let you go. Admiral Strassner is a fanatic, cruel, sadistic. He's the most dangerous man I know. What's the latest information on him? I got a code message this afternoon. You were right. It's the same man, the head man in German intelligence. He went to New York four months ago. Good. And you know the rest. Nine days ago, he wired Berlin to send a woman agent to help him in New York. It was very specific as to size, height, and weight. I know you fit the measurements, but, but you can't do it. Well, how do I look? Oh, Alan, don't, please. Changing places with Elsa Frank is too good to miss. You are sure you've got all of her papers? Oh, yes. Passport, identification, travel permit, ticket to Paris, change at Lisbon for Pan American Flight 377. And you are positive Strasser has never seen her? I don't know. That's another reason why you shouldn't go. It's a risk I'll have to take. Come on. You can tell me the rest on the way to the airport. I wrote a complete description of Elsa Fulman in my report. When I've memorized it, I'll either eat it or burn it. Helen, I, I wish you wouldn't go. I've got to go. Strass was a maniac. Have you ever seen him? Yes, once. He's small. Very small for a man. Fair hair, never drinks nor smokes. Personal friend of Himmler's. Oh? Very clever at disguising himself. Does all sorts of things with his voice. Ventriloquism. He's a... Oh, well, I suppose it's no use. If you're going, you're going. Admiral Strasser has been in New York for a month. He wouldn't go at all except for something of the most vital importance. Believe me, the risk is worth it. Your first mistake will be your last. Now, I will drive you all the way to the airport. You can walk from here. Uh, put on that coat. The cold wind. Shall I contact our man in New York? Immediately you arrive. Bryant on Madison Avenue. You know him. Yes. Well, goodbye, dear friend. God bless you, Karen. Good luck. Elsa Franz, 28, blonde hair, blue eyes, Marseille, 1935, Berlin, 1939. My name is Elsa Franz, my age is 28. I must be drab, no makeup, no nail polish. I must disguise my mind, my heart, my body. I studied the farmer's report over and over from Lisbon to New York. From La Gavia, I take a taxi to the Bryant's Art Gallery for Madison Avenue. This is our contact. The saleswoman stares when I ask for Mr. Bryant personally. And at last, I am alone with him in his office. I can stop being Alpha Prime. Have you anything new on Admiral Strassman, Mr. Bryant? Only that we know he has in his possession something of vital importance to this country. What? We don't know. Have you his address? I'll write it down for you. 
here. Hmm, Park Avenue. He's using the apartment of a friend, the Baron Henrik von Weil. And who is von Weil? We've never seen him. What else can you tell me? Strasbourg is sailing on the Europa for Germany two weeks from tonight. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't leave unless he had what he came for. And he wouldn't come at all unless it was for something very big. Right. Have the operators seen the German Lloyd boat? A steward named Martindale on the Europa. An orchestra leader named Borland on the Bremen. Incidentally, we plan to kill Strassner rather than let him sail. You'll do nothing of the sort. I've come 3,000 miles to pose as Admiral Strassner's assistant. But we can't let him get away. Recovering whatever it is he's stolen is more important than killing him. I understand that I am in charge of the case. Well, naturally. Then do nothing until you hear from me. I'll go up to Admiral Strassner now. <laughs> Yes, I'm looking for Admiral Strassner. Admiral Strassner moved away from here. Where? I don't know. This is Baron von Weil's apartment. Then let me speak to him. Baron von Weil passed away two days ago. Oh. I'm Elsa Frung. Who are you? Come in, please. So, you are Elsa Frung. Why didn't you say so? Let me see your papers. I will show my papers to no one but Admiral Strassner. I'm surprised to learn he has uh, moved. Come this way. No, I'm sorry. I, I believe. Come this way, I said. I don't understand. He will. In here, please. She's here. Go in. So, you finally got here. It took you long enough. You are... Wilhelm Strassner at your service, Fräulein Frung. Turn around, please. <gasps> Why are you startled? Have you never seen a coffin before? Don't look so nervous. There's nobody in it. As yet. <laughs> I think she'll do nice to fry her. At least she's the right size. Admiral Strasser, I don't understand this. I'm sure it is amusing. Be quiet. But... I'll explain when I'm ready. Get the clothes fryer. Yes, Admiral Strasser. Your papers, please. Thank you. Passport. Identification. The number. One more than the date. Which is? Seven. Hurry with us, clothes, Fryer. So you are the famous Elsa Fung, eh? Yes, but this coffin, what is it for? It's a very special coffin. Look, I'll show you. Beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> White satin pillow, lining, an air hole so I can breathe. Solid bronze. It can be locked inside by the corpse or outside by the pallbearer. Fry up. All right, all right, I have them. And if they don't fit, it's not my fault. I'm not a dressmaker. Pull them up to her. But, Admiral, these clothes are, are for a funeral. Yes, Fräulein, mine. You will be my widow and my Leichenbegleiter. I am to guard a, a corpse? Me. They'll do, Friar. Widow's weeds don't have to fit. And be sure they're plenty long and the veil heavy. Use two thicknesses for the veil. Yes, Admiral Scott. I don't go, Friar, wait. Fräulein, my plans have had to be changed. You and I are sailing on the brain in this evening. Good night. I happen to know that American intelligence here would rather kill me than let me leave. They think I am sailing on the Europa two weeks from now. Instead, we sail tonight. I'm going to board the Bremen as a corpse in that coffin. We will leave here in two hours. You have that long to get ready. So there's a bedroom and a bath. You may wash and rest, then change into these clothes. Yes, Admiral. Uh, that is all. Leave us. Well, Fire, what do you think? Don't take her. Take me. Why should I be left behind? Ah, stop it, Fire. No, remember, I will phone you from the brain of the night before it docks. Unless it is my voice, you will do nothing. Your voice? You have a thousand. Oh, surely you will recognize me from me? Oh, yes. I'll recognize you. Only when you get spoken instructions from me will you destroy the duplicates. Is that clear? <laughs> Lighten the glider. A cop accompanies you. The long black widow sweeps. He has thought of everything. Death certificate. A bill must paid in full from one of the best funeral parlors in New York. 
I was now Frau Hedwig von Weil, mourning the husband whose body she was taking back to Germany for burial. Five silent Germans carried it at Pier 60 where the Bremen sailed. The captain of the great ship himself met with the gangplank. I am Captain Edward von Spiegel. Everything has been arranged. Thank you, Herr Captain. If the forebears will proceed us. Would you please, gentlemen? Yes. May I offer you my arm, Frau von Weil? Thank you, Captain. Strassner had managed the impossible. A first-class stateroom on the Bremen for a coffin. An A-deck cabin. And filled with flowers. The cabin door shut out the noise of the transatlantic sailing, the champagne, the streamers, and the last-minute goodbye. It was not until we were in the open sea that the coffin opened. Uh, well, my first successful impersonation of a corpse. I am stunned that you could manage it. The flowers, the pallbearers, even the captain. Captain von Spiegel is one of the most trusted operators in German intelligence. Now telephone for your dinner to be served in the cabin. I'm hungry. were served in the cabin. One meal, ordered by me, intended for me, eaten by him. He'd leave me a few scraps at all, a mouthful of cold coffee. The portholes were closed and draped. At the end of four days, I was so hungry, I, I, I was weak. He could get into the coffin and close the lid in less than five seconds. Whenever there was a knock at the door, he went through the same grotesque performance. Wait. Say, just a minute. Just a minute. Lower your hair when you answer the door. I told you that. Yes. Uh, I'm ready. Lower the lid quietly. Yes? The captain's compliment, Frau von Weiler. And would you do him the honor of dining privately with him in his cabin? Oh, don't you, my Fräulein. Give Captain von Spiegel my, my regrets and thanks. But I prefer to be alone. All right, she's gone. Uh, get out of those clothes. What? I wish to telephone New York. It would be dangerous to use the phone in this cabin. A corpse should not talk, nor should a widow have her husband's voice. We arranged that on the fifth night out, the captain would invite me to dinner when the coast was clear. Invite you to dinner? I cannot explain everything you do not understand, Fräulein. You can change in the bathroom, put on a dress, put on anything. I want your clothes. About this man was danger. Otherwise, it would have been funny. I changed into one of Elsa Frank's drab black dresses. He put on the long, loose-fitting widow's weed. Now I realized why my size had been so important. He was a small man, and the clothes fit him. With the veil on, it was, it was just unbelievable. Well, how do I look? You'll never get away with it. If someone speaks to you, another passenger, a member of the crew... I've played many parts in this business, Fräulein. Young men, old men, even women... Your vocal quality is very interesting, but rather hard to get. Do you mean to say you can impersonate my voice? <laughs> if necessary. Uh, <clears throat> Do you mean to say you can impersonate my voice? I am throwing the vial from Berlin. That is I am convinced there is no danger. It, it would be funny if it, if it For wasn't... For two weeks, I impersonated quite a famous Russian actress. She was a great artist. Uspinskaya. <clears throat> Since there is nothing I can do to convince you, I will say nothing more. 
Nevertheless, it is possible to fool all of the people all of the time. <laughs> How is that? It's fantastic. See if anyone is outside the door. All right. There is a stewardess down the corridor. Then listen. We'll see how she reacts. Lock the door after I leave. I'll be back in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Ach, guten Abend, Frau von Weile. A little air, huh? I'm dining with Captain von Spiegel after all. B, B, B. Oh, here it is. Borland, Ray. Orchestra 502. Mr. Borland. Yes. Ray Borland, the orchestra leader. Yes, who's this? A friend. A, a friend with a plain white visiting card. A grain of wheat? Blue in the center. The farmer? Yes. Can you come to aid at cabin 7-1 right away? It's urgent. Right away. And please, uh, bring me something to eat. A sandwich. Anything. Just hurry. <laughs> Captain von Spiegel, I have no sense of humor. I do not enjoy masquerading as a woman. Will you please place my call to New York? Uh, certainly, Admiral Stassner. I meant no offense. Who's that? I don't know. Ask who it is. Don't open the door. Yeah? Mr. Borland just went to cabin 71 on aid, Captain. All right, Frank. What do you mean? 71 is my cabin. Who is Borland? The orchestra leader. Four hours ago, we got a code cable from Berlin warning us about him. An American agent. I did tell the steward to keep an eye on him. I rather think Ilsa Frum can take care of him. Put my call through and then I'll get back. Right. Captain von Spiegel. Get me ship to Shaw, McKay, New York. Sacramento 20098. Right. She'll call me back. It will be long? No. Elsa may be in trouble. Tell the operator to hurry. Do you want any help with Borland? I'll take care of him personally. Now, you'll be careful. While this ship is technically German territory, we can't allow anything to blatant. I assure you, Captain, Mr. Borland's treatment will be anything but blatant. Tell the operator to hurry that call. <laughs> The lining. White satin marks easily, and he notices everything. Whatever it is, it isn't in the coffin. Then he's carrying it on his person. Well, there isn't much time. We dock tomorrow morning at 7, you know. I know he's carrying something. Something of the most vital importance. Mr. Boland, we have never seen each other before. But we are partners. I'll do anything something. you say. You say two of the farmer's men will meet the ship? Yeah, they're stationed at Bremerhaven. They meet me every voyage. Admiral Strassner must not get off this boat alive. You want me to. to... One of us must. All right, how? We can't search his person unless he's dead. Have you a weapon? Yes, yeah, small automatic with a silencer. Do you want it? No. Uh, I say I'm ill and sent for a doctor. Then you must try to do... Yes, sir. Open the door. He's back. Hide. Where? In the bathroom. Quickly, get in the shower and pull the curtains. Hurry. Right. Shut the door and be quiet. Elsa, hurry. Coming. Thank you, Elsa. Where is she? Who? Oh, don't be coy, Elsa. Where is he? I, I don't know what you mean. The steward saw him come into this cabin. Paul and the orchestra leader. The steward was mistaken. Berlin cabled about him. He's an enemy agent. I I don't know what you are saying. There hasn't been anybody so here. So you I... thought you'd play it both ways, huh? Admiral Strassner, I swear I've been that... standing at that door for two minutes. I heard you talking to him. Admiral Strassner must not get off this boat alive. Indeed. Now, where did he go? Oh, but of course, the bathroom. Then we shall lock him in for a moment, yes? And I will deal with you first. Yes, I will deal with you first. Don't say anything, Elsa. Just get in the coffin. What? Get inside. You are not serious. I know what you are and who you are. Get into that coffin. I won't. Let go of me. Let me go. Suffocation is not a painful death. Please, you don't know what you are doing. Let me go. You, you may... Oh! Uh, 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 
you, my dear Elsa, will be the corpse, and I shall become the widow. There, the pillow over your face. Oh, yes, blanket. To make quite sure you can't breathe. Uh, it'll be a slow, warm death, Elsa. Sleep well. Mr. Borland, I know you're in there. I have a gun. I shall open the door, then I shall count five. Exactly on the word five, you will come out with your hands raised. I will unlock the door, Mr. Borland. <laughs> Elsa! Elsa, I'm watching! Elsa! Elsa! Elsa, you in that coffin? I can't get it open. Elsa! Elsa, I'll have to get help. Take a crowbar to get this thing open. Elsa, I'll have to give us away. God. Help me out. Quickly. All right, put your arm over my shoulder. There we are. Is he, is he dead? Yeah. Search him quickly. All right, take off his shoes. All right. Wait a minute. There's something here under his arm. I should tear the sleeves. That matter? No. All right. Something taped to his body. Oh, oh an envelope. Wrapped in oil skin. Yeah, what do we do now? Get rid of his body. In the coffin? No. What? I've got a plan. Open the porthole quickly. You mean throw him overboard? Please don't ask questions. I know what I'm doing. He's a small man. Open the porthole quickly. Right. Here we are. All right. Can you manage it? He's not heavy. Hat first. Hat first. There. Oh. I've seen him. Oh. Quick. But I don't understand. I, the I... captain knows about you. German intelligence sent a cable warning him about a man named Borland. Get him. For two hours, the ship was in an uproar. Both were lowered. They searched the black, heaving Atlantic. Then they had a full ship's roll call, as I knew they would. Mr. Borland, of course, was missing. The captain looked at me with knowing eyes. Admiral Strassner was naturally not missed at the roll call. Corpses were not counted. The next morning, I ordered breakfast sent up as usual. Mr. Borland was very kind. He let me eat all of it. My first good meal in five days. Then we closed the coffin. Five members of the crew were pallbearers. Again, the captain arranged everything. They were about to carry the coffin down the gangplank when the customs men spoke to me. I am sorry, Frau von Weil. Even with the death certificate, we cannot allow a coffin to customs without opening it. Oh, bitte, I, I beg of you... Show some consideration for a widow's grief. It is impossible. I am sorry. Oh, gentlemen, please. I beg of you. I beseech you to disturb the dead man. Excuse me, Papa Zayn. Don't see the matter. Uh, oh, Captain von Spiegel, I, I please, may I speak to you alone a moment? Certainly, come to see. No, no, no tears. No tears. What is it? They want to open it. Were you responsible for balling? Admiral Strassen threw him overboard. And if they open that coffin, they'll tell that one look that Admiral Strassen is very much alive. Leave it to me. Gentlemen, I am sure that no customs official would be so silly as to question the personal guarantee of Edward von Spiegel, captain of the Bremen. We got off the boat. You did splendidly, Karen. You too, Borland. Thank you, sir. You know, may I ask what Admiral Strassner was carrying? Yes. 
The detailed plans of the P-38 fighter. May I look? Certainly. Addressed to Wilhelm Messerschmitt, Air Ministry, Berlin. Just heard Ilona Massey starring in the new NBC presentation, Top Secret. And here she is to tell you about next week's show. Next week's story concerns a blind beggar in the bazaar of the singing fountain in Tangiers. And the little boy of ten with gray hair. It is a story that has been, until now, Top Secret. have just heard Ilona Massey starring in the new NBC transcribed presentation, Top Secret. The script was written, directed, and produced by Harry W. Junkin. Featured with Miss Massey was Ralph Bell as Admiral Strassner. Others in the cast were Scott Tennyson, Leon Janney, Louis Van Ruten, Connie Lemke, and Lionel Wilson. The music was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shields. This is Fred Collins speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You have been listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.